let's see what we can find on this honcho guy on zodiackillermystery.freeforums.net. There's a post here from 2015 by Z Finder. I feel that Darlene knew her killer and that he used the nickname Zodiac. This is why he didn't use the name Zodiac until after he killed her. Darlene knew how to sew. I wonder if she was the one who made the Zodiac costume for him at his request. The place that Zodiac could have gotten his idea for his name and logo was next to Frank's coffee shop. I understand that Frank was Darlene's uncle who owned the home where Darlene and the mystery man's picture was taken. The mystery man looked exactly like her husband. I have no doubt that it was the Zodiac watch that was the inspiration for Zodiac's name and logo. There is a pretty good chance that Zodiac was a diver like Jim and Darlene and that was a reason for the three of them to go to the Virgin Islands. Great diving waters there. The Zodiac watch is a diver's watch. A response here. The third person of that trio was called Hancho. My bet is that if we can find out who Hancho really was, we will have her killer. Jim won't say because I asked him who Hancho was and he gave me some lame answer like maybe that was her dog's name. I do believe that the Zodiac watch was the inspiration for the name and logo Zodiac uses. I was lucky to see the Zodiac watch case in the window one day at about 1971 while I was walking past the secondhand store in Concord, California. I gave that information to Paul Avery. He gave it to Graysmith, who then told the police. Graysmith gave me the credit for that information in his Zodiac Unmasked book, which was nice of him. Sandy is posting here. This is Sandy's post here. It has been said that Avery and Graysmith were not friends. I find that hard to believe because everything I sent to Paul, he gave to Graysmith. Graysmith told me that himself. I also believe what you said about why Zodiac named himself after Darlene was murdered. I don't agree that she sewed the costume because it wasn't sewn. The only part that may have been sewn would be the logo, and that could have been done with white ink or paint to look sewn. It was put in my car, so I saw it better than even Hartnell could have seen it. It was not hard to make. I was able to make a copy of it as shown on ZodiacKiller.com. It took less than 15 minutes. Too much credit has been given to Zodiac being some genius. I say he has been more lucky than smart. The FBI said the codes were amateurist. That, okay. The code was thought to be much harder than they really were. This is why the professionals couldn't do it. Sort of like a math problem you had in school that you struggled with until the teacher showed you how simple it really was. I mean, that's an interesting point as well. I mean, I'll have to do a dedicated episode on the ciphers and how they were deciphered. But continuing on here, someone posted this. Paul Stein knew Darlene Farron. Darlene Farron worked at the phone company. Where do you think my mother worked? Yep, you guessed it, the phone company. Connection after connection, my mother was born in, also born in Oklahoma, if that says anything. Sandy responded here, there is absolutely no evidence that Darlene knew Paul Stein. There was a rumor that Darlene used to get free rides from Paul when she lived in San Francisco. The fact is that Darlene was murdered weeks before Paul was ever a cab driver. Betty Lou's mother said that baby, baby Lou never sat, babysat for Darlene. Okay. As far as the Zodiac saying he escaped from a prison in Montana, depending on which article you read, it, is, it was also stated that Zodiac said Colorado. I read where Brian Hartnell said it sounded something like Feather, Colorado. When I read that, I thought of Denver, Colorado. I think Zodiac may have been trying to frame Jim Phillips for his crimes. Jim had connections to Colorado. Later, Zodiac sends a Phillips map. He probably knew that Jim was living in San Francisco. He then went there to kill Paul Stein. It almost worked if that was his plan. Because there was a bolo for Jim right after Stein was killed. Jim had connections to Vallejo Benicia, San Francisco areas, and was once married to Darlene. He also liked writing ciphers, as seen by Darlene's mother, and had connections to the San Francisco Presidio. He worked in the editor section of the newspapers. 
Zodiac sent letters to the editor. I do believe that Zodiac knew Darlene and Jim very well. Jim had a reddish-brown crew cut at one time, and he wore horn-rimmed glasses. At times, his hair is very light. When one finds the real Zodiac, the evidence will fit without trying to make it fit. I am talking about physical and forensic evidence such as DNA, prints, handwriting, etc. It isn't going to matter if Zodiac was a Satanist, construction worker, or both. Darlene worked for a very short time at the phone company. It was her friend Bobby who got her the job. Darlene and Jim moved about every three to four weeks, as told by Jim himself. Late 60s, I worked in Vallejo at the nightclub where Darlene hung out. The Coronado Inn. I ate at Terry's where she worked, and she and I dated the same Vallejo cop, Buzz Gordon. What a name. Her family has ID'd the man who has stalked me as the man who killed Darlene. They ID'd a picture I took of my stalker in August of 1990 as her killer. But they were misinformed of his name. They were told the name was Larry Kane. I was convinced that was the correct name, so I investigated Kane until he died. Then a few weeks, months later, my suspect came by my home, and that one was when I realized his name could not be Larry Kane. I have his first name as Robert or Anthony or Tony. That doesn't prove that my suspect is in fact the Zodiac, although I truly believe that he is. It will be forensic evidence that ties my suspect to letters and Lake Berryessa that will hopefully break the case. I am somewhat into astrology and numerology. This month is my month, but I need to watch out for the lunar eclipse. According to what I have read, there will be an end to a problem I have had for a very long time. Of course, I am thinking that this could be the year Zodiac is caught. Now, this was posted here August 2nd, 2017. I'm not sure if this is a repost or not, though. All right, so I guess now is as good a time as any to cover the Sandy Betts story. So Sandy Betts is a controversial figure within Zodiac true crime research. Let's go over her story. So ZodiacCyphers.com did a write-up here on November 25th, 2017. The story surrounding the recollections of Sandy Betts has been taken and edited from the Zodiac Killer Mystery Farm, hosted by Ricardo Gomez. So, here it is. The first time that I actually saw his face was in the winter of 68, around the time of the Lake Herman Road shooting of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. I was working as a waitress and bartender at Flamingo Joe's in Vallejo when I got off work early to pick up my paycheck from the Melody Lounge on Sonoma Boulevard, Vallejo. The same person owned both places, so I would work at both. I also worked at the Coronado Inn for a different owner. It was about 1 a.m. when I left Flamingo Joe's to go to the Melody for my paycheck. When I walked into the Melody Lounge, some male friends that I knew from Richmond called me over to have a drink and talk. I picked up my paycheck and sat with the three men for about 20 minutes. It was nearing closing time, so they walked me out to my car. Thank goodness they stood there for a few moments as my vehicle failed to start. I knew a lot about car maintenance because I used to watch my father regularly work on vehicles and would constantly question him about his work. I asked the men if they could check under my hood to see if my coil wire was okay, and they duly obliged. They proceeded to take a look and commented, Are you psychic or something? Your coil wire is gone. They knew I needed to go home to Napa, so they removed one from someone else's car and put it in mine. Wait a second. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a second. Did they do that with or without permission of the owner? Or did they just go rummaging through other cars in the parking lot to remove a coil wire? Wow. Although, again, before we get into the veracity of Sandy Betts' accounts here, if this is all true, I mean, obviously, we have to think back to the Sherry Joe Bates murder, where apparently there could have been an issue with the vehicle. I thanked them, then drove off towards Napa when I noticed that I was perhaps being followed. This person was about an eighth of a mile back, but I felt I could possibly shake them off. As I got to my turnoff on Emola Avenue next to Napa State Hospital, I knew that there was a dip in the road that might hide the low taillights of my older model Pontiac Bonneville. So I turned right and drove like a bat out of hell. I believe I had lost him, but kept my foot firmly on the pedal just the same. I needed to turn on Navarre Street, but couldn't do that safely on account of my speed, so I turned left at the next block. I then turned off my lights and made another left onto my street. 
It was at this point I saw a car with its lights on parked across the street from my home. Nobody in my neighborhood would be up that late, and I didn't recognize that car. I was curious to see who this person was, so I kept my lights off and pulled up alongside his vehicle. He was looking at my driveway as if to say, where is she? When I looked at his face, I saw the hatred in his contorted face and feared that even running to my front door, I may not make it. This guy looked as if he hated me and thoughts spiraled in my mind that possibly my ex-husband had hired a hitman to kill me so he wouldn't have to pay child support for our three children. How does that work, though? If the mother of children is murdered, isn't the father still supposed to support the kid? I mean, well, th that's kind of weird. All right, anyway... I kept on driving back towards town where two police officers and two police cars were talking at the gas station on the intersection of Soskal and Imola Avenue. I got out of my car and proceeded to outline what just occurred when the same car came across Soskal Avenue behind the gas station. There was an all-night pancake house there. I pointed at him as he crossed, but he simply looked at me talking to the officers. It certainly didn't seem to bother him because he still drove into the parking lot of the restaurant. One officer told the other, Joe, you go check that guy out and I will follow her home to make sure she is safe. And just another side point here, if the guy is a police officer, would he not be afraid of other cops? If this is truly a criminal, unless, of course, if he is deranged and he likes taunting police, I mean, maybe he would. I mean, I don't know. A few months later, Darlene, and there's, I guess there's no follow-up here, unfortunately, on what happened with the officer who checked out the guy. A few months later, Darlene Farron and Michael McGow were shot in Vallejo on July 4th, 1969. McGow had told investigators that the shooter's car was light brown, possibly a Falcon. This tallied with the vehicle that had followed me from Vallejo, so I called Napa Police Department and asked if they had noted the man's name that followed me in the report that night. The woman I spoke to located the report, but it didn't show the name of the man. I didn't think to tell her that there could be two reports because there were two officers. The phone call to Napa Police Department was made in July 1969. Sometime later, my eldest teenage daughter was on the phone one day talking to one of her school friends. As they were conversing, her friend heard the family's other phone ring, so left to answer it. When she came back, she said that the man on the phone had told her that he was the Zodiac Killer. I don't remember what else was said about the call, but both my daughter and her friend were extremely frightened by the experience. I have no idea if that call was reported or whether the phone call was before or after the Lake Berryessa attack on Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. It was likely after because the Zodiac Killer wasn't playing on our minds at the time, not until after the September 27th, 1969 double stabbing. It was only then that the realization dawned that a serial killer was on the loose in our area. During that summer of 69, it must have been my day off work because I was sitting outside my house on the lawn in the front yard. It was a warm day and my neighbor and my next door neighbor, Betty, and I were talking when my husband pulled into the driveway. He walked over to us and said, who in the world would steal a clothesline? That struck me as odd because I hadn't even noticed that it was gone. It was to the right of our driveway along our side yard. However, I could now notice that most of it was missing. I had to replace it, so I bought more at the store on Imola Avenue where I had purchased the previous clothesline. The store was across from the state hospital about one mile or less from my home. My neighbors and I used to talk about the patients escaping, although we believed that if and when they did, that they would go as far away as they could, not remain in the vicinity. Later, I heard that a woman on a block not far from my home had been murdered. I think the street was Marie, but cannot be certain. On Saturday 27th, September 27th, my husband and I were both working in Vallejo that night. My shift started at 6 p.m., so I probably left the house at around 5 or 5.15 p.m. I would work until 2 a.m., during which time my daughter would babysit her brothers. But that night at approximately 8.30 or 9 p.m., while my daughter was changing the baby's diaper in the bedroom, someone was knocking on the front door of the house. There was a man at the door who proceeded to tell my daughter that he was there to look at the house as if it was up for sale. My home was certainly not on the market. 
My son had earlier bumped and cut his head, so the man offered to take him to the hospital, indicating that he thought it looked serious. My children got into the man's car, who had a woman with him, and went to the Queen of the Valley Hospital in his black Cadillac. It wasn't until later that we found out that there had been two victims brought into that same hospital from Lake Berryessa, both of whom had been stabbed. The next day or the day after, both my husband and I had the day off. He went to Soskal House, Napa, a few miles southwest of our home, to have a couple of drinks and roll dice with his friends. I didn't feel like staying home that day without a car and asked Betty if she could give me a ride to get it. I got my baby ready, who was eight months old at the time, and Betty drove us to pick up the car. She got out to help carry the things I needed for the baby. The windows were down in the car because it was very warm that day, and we noticed that there was stuff all over the back seat and on the floor behind the driver's seat. I opened the door to the back and picked up a garment made out of black cotton cloth off the seat. It had a strange design on the front of it that I thought looked Asian. It was a white circle with a cross on top of it or over it. The black cotton material was about a yard and a half long and 36 inches wide. It had a hole with a slit towards the back so it would fit over someone's head. There was a wad of black paper on the floor behind the passenger seat, so I picked it up and opened it to see who the heck it was and quickly realized it was a mask that covered one's head completely. It was made from a paper sack and had large round holes for the eyes, although I don't remember if there was a hole for the mouth and nose or not. It was square and flat on top, just like a grocery bag, and there were four three-inch cuts at the bottom that were bent to sit on a person's shoulders. My initial thoughts was that it must have been an early Halloween costume. As I drove back home, I noticed an awful stench filling the car. It was the paper sack. Whatever was used to make it black was creating the bad smell, so I had to throw it away in the garbage as soon as I got home. Once I got home, I looked at everything that was put in the car. There was a neat stack of things on the floor behind the driver's seat. On the bottom of the stack was an old dictionary, and positioned on top of that was a green plastic template with the letters of the alphabet on it and four circle cutouts from small to large underneath the letters. Next to the dictionary was a ruler from a healed college, H-E-L-D, and two erasers. One was a large gray one, the other pink and smaller in size. Healed college was a private for-profit business career college with its main campus in San Francisco, California. It operated between 1862 and 2015. On top of the green plastic was an ammo can filled with felt tip pens arranged like perhaps an artist would have, except most of the pens were very dark. One was orange or red, one was white. At the bottom of the ammo can were three earrings. One of them was screw-on with a small cross along with a girl's Timex watch with a thin gray leather band. A silver-colored protractor was also inside the can with a small pencil at one end. In addition, at the very bottom was a tiny Catholic mass book. The page that would have had the owner's name on it was torn off. On the back seat was a clear plastic name tag in which the name Daniel Perez was written on white paper. I mean, Daniel Perez is probably a relatively common name. When my husband came home, I asked him if he had given someone a ride because there were some strange things in the back seat of the car. He assured me that no one had been in the car except him, and he didn't see anything in the back seat when he got in a drive. I surmised that maybe some guy worse the wear for drink or cannabis had mistook our car for his own and put it all there. During the Vallejo springtime of 69, my soon-to-be ex-husband and myself leased J. Governor's room on Sonoma Boulevard across from James, James Sears, where Darlene was starting to buy her very expensive clothes. Where she got the money to do that was something that her family didn't understand, but nevertheless had a bad feeling about. On Saturday nights, my husband would hire a bartender to do his job. I was the waitress and would have kept my eye on the bartenders to make sure they weren't tapping the till. My husband would go to the Vallejo Speedway to offer the winner of the main event and his crew free drinks at our bar after the races. I was still filling in at the Coronado Inn because the money was good there. It was always crowded as people would come from as far away as Oakland, San Fran, and Yountville. Vallejo was a Navy town, and during the 60s, the Vietnam War was still raging on. We felt a lot of sadness for the loss of these young men who were defending our country. I lost my brother-in-law, who re-enlisted in 1969. 
On July 1st, 69, my father died unexpectedly at Kaiser Hospital. He had gone in for a hernia operation and died the day before he was due to be released from what I was told was a blood clot. I thought it was unusual for him to be found with his arm up reaching for the buzzer to get help. I wasn't aware that one would know that a clot had moved to the lungs and would have had enough time to ring for help. I was devastated beyond belief, so my husband and I went to Walnut Creek to stay by my mother's side until after my father was buried. Our lease was up at Jay's governor's room, but a few of my friends still liked to go there to drink. One of them was Don Porter, who I dated. I had no idea he was the counterfeit ring that was going on in Vallejo at the time. He was being watched by the FBI. They were watching him in the bar while he lit Lady his cigarettes with his $20 bills. They arrested him that night and found a lot more of the counterfeit bills to the trunk, in the trunk of his car. I had no idea he was doing this. He was stealing cars, chopping them up, and repainting them to sell along with his co-conspirators. I remember one afternoon, he and I were going to San Fran to visit somebody. His roommate was on the porch. Don said to him that we were headed to San Francisco, but needed to stop by D's place to pick something or drop something off. His roommate, who was a short man in his 30s with brown curly hair, who liked to play the piano, screamed at Don, I told you to never say that name ever. I would not have remembered that name if it weren't for that man making such a scene. Are they talking about D? Stop by D's place. In early October 69, I got a daytime job in Rutherford working at the Robert Mondavi Winery. While I was there, a movie was being filmed for CBS television. The star of the movie was Burt Reynolds, although at the time I didn't know who he was because it was before he became famous. I had a hard time not staring at him. What a hunk. The next day, the director asked me if I would like to be in the movie. I said I would if I could have one of my friends join me so we could both be in the movie. While we were waiting for our scene, we were in a room with Bert and a few other actors. I am not sure how I ended up with Bert lifting me up above his head and sliding me slowly down close to his body, but he said in a low voice while looking at me nose to nose, you are one healthy girl. I still remember that moment as if it were yesterday. I was only an extra, but was a key extra. Some of the film was shot in St. Helena, Santa Rosa, Lake Berryessa, I now wonder if Zodiac could have been there as an extra or just watching. The film was entitled Hunters Are for Killing, also known as Hard Frame. And for the people who think that she's completely 100% full of it, she does have a photograph with Burt Reynolds. My divorce was about a final. The children and I moved away from Napa to Rio Vista where their father had moved so they wouldn't be too far from him. I got a job at the Spindrift Marina restaurant on the San Joaquin River. Working three days a week, the other four I spent fishing with my children. I started getting phone calls and could hear someone breathing, but whoever it was would never say anything. Then the car kept having odd problems, like the oil filter can would fall off while I was driving and all of the oil would leak out. Or my tire would be flat while I was parked at my apartment. I was still going to Vallejo to the Coronado Inn at night from time to time and still seeing Buzz Gordon, a cop that I started to date while I was working in Vallejo in 1969. We dated for about five years not knowing he was married at the time. Did she state she was married at the time as well? I mean, I'm having trouble with this timeline here. Furthermore, then finding out that he had gone out with D Darlene Farron and was a Zodiac suspect. Now, I'm not going to get into Buzz Gordon here. He's, he's a suspect, some people believe. He is uh, one of the, he should be one of the primary suspects. But just a quick aside here, Sandy posted this regarding Buzz. She posted this, this is from Tapa Talk, so I don't know where the original was, but this was dated April 17th, 2008. I don't, again, I don't know if this is reposted or this was the original date. I find it very interesting because when Darlene was killed, I asked Buzz, who I was dating before she was killed and after. Buzz and I dated for about five or six years. I had no idea he was married, let alone dating Darlene. When she was killed, I asked Buzz if he knew her. He said he had heard of her, but didn't really know her.
Then I read they had both dated when I read Graysmith's book in 1987. I found Buzz in 90 living in Chico and working for PG&E. I called him, we spoke for a few minutes, and then I asked him again about Darlene. He told me that she was a one night stand and that she was in love with him. He said she even moved in with a few blocks of him just to be close. I asked him if she ever mentioned being followed or bothered. He said yes, that she said the man was an old hippie but didn't give his name. Uh-oh. I knew he had to turn in his gun because it was a 9 mil. It was thought for a short time that she could have been killed by a Vallejo cop. Buzz fit the description of the killer and had at the time some kind of gun. I knew he was upset that he was questioned. He left the police department soon after being questioned. I mean, an innocent person might have done that as well if they were just really pissed off about that. It seems odd to me that after all these years, he still couldn't tell me the truth about his relationship with Darlene. He will always have a small piece of my heart. He and I used to park in hopes that the Zodiac would try something and we could get him caught. I still don't know if I was just plain stupid or brave. L-O-L. A couple other posts here. Buzz was on a motorcycle patrol the night of the murder. When he came into office and he found out that Dee had been murdered. And this person posted this. Must have had poor police communications back then. Wouldn't he have heard it over his police radio while on patrol? How many 9mm did he own and which one was turned in? Another post here. On the subject of Vallejo PD having a motor officer patrolling at night in 69, Nancy Slover has remarked on several occasions, sometimes quite adamantly, that the PD had two motorcycles at the time, and they were never engaged for duty that night. Anyone who says otherwise, according to Nancy, doesn't know what they're talking about for what it's worth. Interesting. So if that's true... If that's true, that neither motorcycle was supposed to be on duty, and Buzz is saying that he was on duty on the motorcycle, I mean, that's a little bit suspicious. That is a little bit suspicious. But back to Sandy Betts' story here. We dated for about five years, not knowing he was married at the time. Furthermore, then finding out he had gone with Darlene Farron and was a Zodiac suspect. He and I would be in his squad car, go to the areas where we thought the Zodiac killer might go so we could catch him. He would have his 9mm ready just in case the Zodiac showed up. I mean, how, how lawful is that? An officer having his girlfriend in his vehicle while trying to, while trying to lure a serial killer? I mean, that sounds kind of dangerous and not in line with protocol in any way. I mean, that's kind of weird. I actually offered myself as a decoy to the Vallejo Police Department, but they told me that they had no idea when or where Zodiac would strike again and that they didn't have the money or manpower to do that. I look back on that now and how foolish I was for making that offer. I always wanted to work in law enforcement and bust drug dealers or work at solving murders. That started in the 50s with the case of Stephanie Bryant, who was kidnapped from Berkeley on April 28, 1955, then murdered. To this day, I do not feel that Burton Abbott was her killer. And I'm not going to go into the Stephanie Bryan case uh, and Burton Abbott high-profile uh, execution in California. Some people believe that uh, there were a lot of issues with that and that he was framed and all these things. I mean, there's definitely a lot of information there. Perhaps I'll do a dedicated episode on that case. Seems to warrant it, but let's continue here with Sandy Betts's account. My father who worked in Oakland but would drive through the Berkeley Hills and past Stephanie Bryan Street to get home to Walnut Creek reported seeing something or someone suspicious pertaining to that case. He gave the police a description of a car with a young girl in it. That in turn made my father a suspect. He never offered any information ever again to police. I have no idea if the person he turned in retaliated against our family and is now the man who plays these childlike games with me or not. 
We did have a prowler in the 50s who would go into our backyard and run a stick alongside the wooden slats to make a ticking sound. I can remember whenever I was home alone, I would hold our 22 rifle just in case the person tried to break in. Could he be the same person today? I don't know. While living in Rio Vista and working only three days a week, I drove a 67 Pontiac Firebird. I was still having problems with the oil filter falling off now and then, and my brakes kept going out. One night, when I had a few female friends with me, the brakes went out and we almost ended up in the river. The phone calls were still coming at night from someone who would never speak. Only breathing could be heard. I don't believe I was thinking that it was the man I got away from in Vallejo a few years before. I thought by moving he wouldn't know where I was, so I wasn't worried. I mean, that does seem kind of coincidental, though. If, if her account is all true, I mean, brain fingerprint scan technology, of course, would, would be useful here. But if her account is completely true here, why she thought there was a second individual who also just called her and breathed heavily? And it wasn't the same guy. I mean, that's kind of weird. There was a handsome guy named Ralph who seemed sort of distant, who, who would come in on Saturday nights. He was very different than most of the men who came in and flirted with me. He was the opposite, and it sort of bothered me. I wondered why he didn't seem to like me. Then one night, he came in, and I walked over to him and asked what he would like to have. He said, I would like to marry you. I thought it was pretty funny that he, who was so cool towards me, was interested after all. I joked back, well, sure, I am not busy when I get off work. We started to date and became engaged several months later. Wow. So for all the people listening, that seems to be a viable pickup line. I would like to marry you. <laughs> he had a boat and would take my children with him to fish and swim. Ralph would tell me odd stories about when he was a frogman in the Navy and how he would reach under a man's ribcage, pull the man's heart out, show it to him before he died. I was not impressed. One day when he was at my apartment and we were cooking game hens, he said something that was disturbing to my daughter. I don't remember what it was, but it upset her. His friend was there as well, and we were doing handwriting analysis after dinner. My daughter made the comment, geez, Ralph... You write just like the Zodiac. She was right. It did look like the Zodiac's handwriting that we saw in the newspaper. It was sometime later when his friend was telling me a story about the three of them boating at Lake Berryessa and that when they woke up one morning, Ralph had a hood on his head. Now that was becoming too much for me to keep to myself. After all, Ralph had once told me how he planned at one time to kill his ex-wife, but didn't, or so he claimed. He also said to me that one of his fantasies was to commit the perfect murder. By now, I knew I had to get out of this relationship. <laughs> what tipped her off? Meanwhile, I called Dave Toshi and told him everything I knew about Ralph. Dave asked me to get some of Ralph's handwriting and send it, and send it to him. I wanted to get away from him as fast as I could without upsetting him, so I told him that I had a modeling offer in Southern California. He said that if I took the job, he wouldn't be with me. As far as he knew, I took the job. Dave Toshi called to let me know that Ralph had only one DUI arrest and that his picture looked eerily similar to the description of Zodiac. Ralph knew how much money was on Zodiac's head at the time, I thought that was interesting that he would know such a thing. Why, though? I mean, if the Zodiac was that popular. In 1971 or 72, my friend Verna and I decided to go east over the bridge towards the Spindrift Marina, where I worked, to a place just past the Spindrift for a few games of pool. For whatever reason, instead of going east over the bridge, I drove to Verna's house, perhaps to use the restroom. Within a couple of minutes of being there, my daughter called to say that a bomb had exploded near the Spindrift Marina, and that they were evacuating everyone off the island. Luck was with us because we would have been right on top of the explosions had we not stopped at Verna's first. Whatever it was, it blew a hole in the road 12 feet wide and 12 feet deep. It swept the boats in the marina away from their berths with people on top of their roofs to keep from drowning. It flooded the cornfields and water went all the way to Stockton. My boyfriend, who owned the Spindrift, never understood what caused that to happen. The year before, on July 4th, both of his restaurants were set on fire within an hour of each other. 
One was the Spindrift, the other was near Sacramento called the Captain's Table. Okay, so I was about to call BS on this whole story because as far as I remember, I can't recall seeing anything about a bombing. Now, she can't remember the exact year, which is probably a little strange because it says here 71 or 72. Does that lend more credibility to the story? But anyway, uh, some people did some digging, and apparently it wasn't a bomb, but there was a flood that took place June in 1972 on Andres Island. June 25th. And so apparently it was reported that Army Corps engineers, something happened with Army Corps engineers in the area, but it sounded like a bomb. Now, this is supposedly some kind of levee failure, and there is reference to this. Texas A&M University has, uh, on their oaktrust.library.tamu.edu, they actually have a document here, levee failures in the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta, characteristics and perspectives, a dissertation by Frank Hopf that mentions this so-called levee failure that caused flooding. So it's curious, this is definitely not a popular event, but you know what else is really weird is June 25th, 1972, uh, apparently there were flood evacuations in Auburn, New York as well, and there was a hurricane and flood here on the other side of the country. Historic flood. This is, uh, it was before the 25th, actually. The historic flood, June 1972, Hurricane Agnes and the Genesee River flooding. The most destructive widespread flooding to occur in the eastern U.S. occurred in June 72 as a result of Hurricane Agnes. So this is New York State, all the way on the other side of the country. So these are just weird curiosities, but apparently, so this wasn't a bomb, but it was something. So is this a case of Sandy Bats being mostly truthful, just not having exact details? Because I was about to just call BS on this whole thing, because how would this not be not how would this not be documented that there was a bomb or whatever? But whatever the case was, there was a levy failure of some kind. Okay, continuing on here. And it would also be curious if someone, I don't know how many people did some digging into her reports, like, for example, the fires that occurred on July 4th. I mean, is there police documentation of everything she's claiming here? Because she's got the photo with Burt Reynolds on their film shoot. Uh, you know, there was this levee failure and flooding. I mean, it seems like there, there's some uh, there's some evidence to back up some of her claims here. Sometime before the flood, someone took a shot at him from the levee road. Still, I don't... Someone was shooting at him? What the heck is going on here? Still, I don't think I gave any thought to my secret admirer being behind all of these strange happenings. I was now out of work because of the flood, but thank goodness I was known to be a good waitress because I received a call from the owner of the sugar barge asking if I would work for him, so I started immediately working there three or four nights a week. I mean, was there really a waitress? Was there really... Is it really that hard to get a job as a waitress in California? I don't know. I moved from Rio Vista to Clayton and rented a home with three other girls. I believe the year was 1973. While we were looking for a place to rent, we went through a real estate agent who showed us a place that was run once rented by some members of the Symbionese Liberation Army. Okay, I mean, are there too many coincidences in her story? So either her, if her story is true, I mean, the amount of connections to the Zodiac Killer here, I mean, it's kind of, it, I mean, you'd have to say, I mean, it's, it would be relatively conclusive that this individual would have to know her if her story is true and he is the Zodiac Killer. We didn't want to take that one, so we took one in Clayton on Claycord Street. While living there, I worked at a place in Pleasant Hill named Rick's Lounge. It was a huge place with live music and sat in a mall with a large parking lot. A friend I went to school with owned it. One night, I had got off work just before closing time when I saw a man in a station wagon sitting across the parking lot who waved at me. I waved back, thinking he was a customer who was leaving as well. He pulled out when I did and ended up behind me. I had a feeling that he might be planning on following me, so when I got out of the parking lot and was at a stoplight, I decided to make a U-turn back into the parking lot. The man behind followed suit. 
confirming my suspicions that he indeed was following me. I parked my car near the front door to Rick's and ran towards the door. The man stepped on the gas and tried to run me over. He had light hair styled in a crew cut. I don't remember his face, but recall that he looked older than me. His station wagon had wooden panels with a rack on top. A conservative looking car, unlike what a young person would be driving. I didn't connect this incident with my secret admirer either. Unless he had different wigs, he didn't look like the man in Vallejo in 68 who had dark brown hair. While still living on Claycord in Clayton, the girls and I noticed a man hanging around in an orange Volkswagen. He would just sit in his car near our home. I can remember his face as being real red looking, more than just flushed. He possibly had a skin condition like a rash. We started to get the same sort of calls that I had received when I lived in Napa and Rio Vista, just someone breathing on the other end. Then one day, there was a voice that said, I just want you to know, I know where you live. I could hear music playing in the background, but it wasn't anything that I recognized, such as rock and roll, country, or jazz. By then, I was dating Mike, someone who was in my life up until a few years ago. We maintained a friendship for many years until he married, but one day stood out that I still can't forget. We had spent the night together in Concord at his place, and in the morning while Mike was in the shower, I was still in bed waiting for my turn to shower. I heard a slight noise at the window that was about six feet from the bed. I opened my eyes and saw a large, muscular, hairy arm coming through the open window. I let out a scream and the man left. Mike tried to see if he could see anything out the window, but the man was out of sight. Could that be the same person who was harassing me? How could one person have so many strange things happening to them? No one I know of has had anything even remotely close to what I had going on. Even now, it only happens to me and Pam Huckabee. Not so much her anymore as she is in a gated community in another state. And Pam Huckabee is, of course, Darlene Farron's sister. You know what's weird, though? A lot of people say that these are just crazy people looking for attention. But here's the thing. Let's say she is crazy. Again, is there some magic rule in the universe that prevents crazy people from ever being victims of criminals? Or are the chances increased that they'd be a victim? Because they might not be able to take safety precautions or whatever. Their choices might be hampered by their mental conditions. It's weird. A lot of coincidence theorists and even so-called true crime aficionados, they think that if someone's on drugs or if they're crazy, somehow that means their story can't be true. It's really weird. It's really weird. Around 1973... I had saved up enough money to put a down payment on a condominium in Walnut Creek just off of Ignacio Valley Road. It was very close to Heather Farm Park, once owned by Bing Crosby, but later remembered for the abduction site of a young girl on a bike who has never been found. That took place while I was living there, and she was a schoolmate of my son at the time. I mean, the coincidence to act is pretty high here with uh with sandy betts i wonder how much verification was done into all of her accounts here because what are the chances that there's this much weirdness i mean literal attacks on her life all i mean the stalking i mean a lot of people are stalked and maybe phone calls but all this other stuff i mean what are the chances lisa dickinson's nine was last seen near the pleasant hill station of the bay area rapid transit on September 5th, 1976. By now, I am at Pier 29, family restaurant in Oakland, working for the same owner of the Spindrift restaurant, Harry Schilling Sr. Only now I am working five nights a week instead of three. One night I was driving home from Pier 29 when I noticed someone was behind me for a long time, so thinking I am being followed again. I remembered reading that it is a good idea to drive to a police station, so when I got to Walnut Creek, I drove to the police station and started to honk the horn to get help. That worked right away as an officer came to the car. I told him that an orange Volkswagen was following me all the way from Oakland and should be showing up in a second. The person following me must have not known Walnut Creek very well, or he, he would have known that that is where the police station is located. They spoke to the man in the Volkswagen, 
who said yes, he followed me because he liked me, but meant no harm. He said that he was from the Alameda Navy base. They sent him on his way and I drove to my apartment. I always looked in my rear view to make sure I wasn't being followed and still do that to this day. You know what's weird though? So did they get the guy's name? And is this the same Volkswagen that was outside her house at her previous address? I mean, this is all crazy. This is all really crazy, if true. The odd phone calls were still coming. I am not sure if I connected them to all of the other calls or not. One call was a man who said he was doing a thesis and needed to ask me questions. I forgot everything he asked, but the questions became uncomfortable. And I knew whoever this man was wasn't a nice person. He started asking me about my daughter, who was 16 years old. I wanted to get this person caught and tried to set him up. I called the police and told them everything, but the man was never caught. Could that man be the one who is bothering me still? I have no way of knowing for sure. If he was my stalker, was he upset at all the guys I dated? Did he think I was a lot like Darlene? In 1975, I met someone, fell in love, and married him two years later. He lied to me about his age, and over time, he became 14 years younger than I. He is the one who taught me all about guns and how to shoot. We joined the American Sportsman Club and went hunting, fishing, and camping whenever we had a chance. My children loved the camping part of it. That wasn't so new to me. I grew up camping with my parents and frequented Lake Berryessa to camp many times, as well as the coast of Jenner and Fort Bragg. See, Sandy Beck seems to have connections to just all, just about every single aspect of the Zodiac Kings. From 1977 to 1982, my name was changed, and I had moved from Walnut Creek, so I felt more comfortable during that period in my life. The only bad thing that took place was with one of my best friends, Dana, who moved about the same time I did to the town of Antioch. I do interior decorating with my friend Dana, wanted me to help her kitchen. We each borrowed three wallpaper books to take to her home so we could pick out which would look the best. She was so happy about buying her first home at the age of only 24. That was the day before her parents found her body on the kitchen floor on my birthday. So I actually couldn't find any corroboration because uh, she doesn't list Dana's last name here. But carrying on this account here. The night before I received a phone call at about 9.30 p.m., no one spoke, so I hung up and took the phone off the hook so we could get some sleep without any more calls. It was the next day that I was told by my other friend that Dana was dead. It was made to look like a suicide, she was shot with a 22 cal weapon, which she owned for protection. The gun was found in her living room near the front door, yet her body was in the kitchen several feet away. Her phone was found off the hook. Dana's mother asked if we would clean up the kitchen floor where her body was found. We did. I also fixed Dana's hair for her funeral, which is when I noticed that someone had cut her hair. I was the one who she would ask to cut her hair, and it was longer the last time I saw her, which was only a few days before. While I was sitting at her kitchen table looking out towards the road below, I happened to see a man looking up at us as he was driving by. He had curly dark brown hair with a round face that reminded me of the man from Vallejo in 1968. It was almost a surprised look he had on his face when he saw us there. Could he be the one who killed our dear friend and made it look like a suicide? It was because her home was locked up that the Antioch Police Department believed she had killed herself. The patio door had an automatic pen that would lock if you closed it. Did the police ever ask her friends any questions about Dana? No, they did not. I believe Dana was murdered. She was very happy and had a lot to look forward to. Who plans on decorating their brand new home and shoots themselves instead? Hmm. I mean, yeah, this is tough. So Vallejo 68, now this is closer to 78, 1980, 10 years later, is it the same guy? My young husband was a bit spoiled by his mother. She gave him anything he wanted, so he didn't have much incentive to work. 
I was earning enough to take care of us all. Because my credit was very good, he bought a boat without mentioning it to me. This made me responsible for all of the payments, which I was not happy about. It was about five years into that marriage when I had a feeling that he was straying. Long story short, I filed for divorce, filled his boat with his clothes, and sent him home to his mother. When I changed my name back to Betts, it wasn't long before the odd phone calls started up again. I started to notice someone was following me again. He was clever as he would park at different areas he knew I would pass by, and then he would pull out and follow. You know, another thing, like, what is the average time frame for a stalker? I started to notice someone following me again. He was clever as he would park at different areas he knew I would pass by, and then he would pull out and follow. A few times he would wait on the side of the highway and then pull out thinking I didn't notice. One was a Chevrolet truck with a gun rack. It held a large rifle. I memorized many of the license plate numbers when one day I spotted one older green car with a plate I had seen before. This time I followed him. It was Veterans Day, November 11th, in the late 80s. She didn't report all these plates? Three or four days later, I was in the Lions restaurant drinking coffee, talking to my friend who attended bar there, when my car alarm went off. One of the waitresses knew my car and told me it was going off. Something told me it was a ploy for me to go outside, so I went to the door and used my clicker to shut the alarm. About an hour later, I left for Alameda to do some work at one of my friend's homes before going to work in Oakland. As I got to the tunnel that separated Orinda and Oakland, I heard a shot but wasn't sure if it was a backfire or not. Then, halfway into the tunnel, I heard another shot. This time, I knew it was gunfire, so I started to weave around to hope of hopefully evade being struck. As I was coming out of the tunnel, the last shot rang out. Then I saw him in an older blue Cadillac convertible. He drove past me pretty fast, so I didn't get the plate number that time. I knew better than to try and catch up with him as he headed towards Hayward. When I got to my friend's home in Alameda, I called to make sure that it was reported and was told that others had reported it too. A few months later, I wanted to get a copy of the report and was told that because no one was hurt, it wasn't kept. Well, that's awfully convenient. I mean, why they? that's hard to believe that if there was gunfire, they wouldn't have kept a report, regardless of it, whether anybody was hurt or not. By 89, I knew that the man I believed to be the Zodiac was stalking me and following me almost every day and night to and from work. He was becoming more bold. He didn't seem to care if I was on to him or not. It was as if he and R.H. were taking turns haunting me. You know what's weird, though? I mean, this seems to be a woman who's pretty good with men and has a lot of friends. She really didn't have any guys that could just, like, beat this guy up. I mean, it's kind of weird. Maybe Burt Reynolds, perhaps? One day I was on my way to work in Oakland when I stopped at a post office box on 23rd Avenue. I had some information I was sending to the Department of Justice in Sacramento. I didn't notice until I had parked next to the box that R.H. was right behind me, parking as well. He was in a faded red car like a boxy Volkswagen with a plate that read K0K0. I believe I knew about the Mikado by then because seeing the word Coco on the plate was a clever move on his part. I got out of the car, mailed the letter, looked over at RH. I got back into my car and went to work. As I approached my workplace, there is a place in the middle of the road where I would wait for a break in the traffic to cross over to the parking lot to park up. When I neared the break in the middle of the road, I saw a brown wallet. I didn't pick it up because it was too dangerous to do that, but went to my manager, told her about the wallet, and went with her to retrieve it. It contained a driver's license with a picture of a male on it, so my manager said she would try to find the person and return the wallet. I don't remember the name on that license or if she found the owner or not. To this day, I wonder if that wallet was some sort of plant or not for me to get out of my car and get run over by a hit-and-run driver. You know what's weird, though? Again, if we're taking this all on face value, there was the one guy who tried to run her over years previous. Is this not the same guy? So she's got two different stalkers, possibly three or four. I mean, I don't know what we're dealing with. Is one of them the Zodiac and then others are not the Zodiac? 
One Sunday afternoon, a man and two women came in and ordered drinks. The gentleman went over to the piano to play a tune. One of the women said, Ron, could you please play dash dash dash? For whatever reason, I had the gut feeling the man was Ron Pimentel. And as it turned out, I was correct. I had read about him in Robert Graysmith's Zodiac book. I told him a little bit about my stalker. He was very interested and gave me his home car and cell phone numbers. He told me to call him the next time the suspect came to my job, which by now was almost every night. Sure enough, my suspect came in, so I went into the office to call Ron. The phone behind the bar had lights that would show when the office phone was in operation. So when I made the call, the suspect knew I was contacting someone. He then would leave. Ron wasn't there in time to see the suspect. Why didn't he just, if he's there every night, why didn't she just tell him to come? <laughs> it was weeks later that Ron called me to, to tell me he believed my suspect was sitting in a white Jaguar in front of his office. Ron's car had antennas all over it with a license plate that showed he was a private investigator. So whenever Ron would be at my work, my suspect would not come in until Ron would leave. I mean, really? He's a PI? He can't take a cab there? Then he would be there within a few minutes. It's as if he sat in his car waiting for Ron to leave. Ron died a year or so after that. I have no idea how. I kept my gun with me 24-7. One of the waitresses got off late one night and was hit in the head with something as she walked to her car. It wasn't a robbery because she still had her purse. And she didn't see the person who hit her. I then started to walk outside of work with my gun in my hand, looking over my shoulder. I would walk with other waitresses who were worried about their safety too. Nothing happened to any of us walking to our cars after that. People reported to me that they saw a blonde haired man looking through my car windows, but when I would walk outside to see if I could see him, he would be gone. That could have been RH wearing his light colored wig. One customer said he saw the man just sitting in his car reading a book and spitting out the window. He even wrote to me once and said he didn't know why he was afraid to tell me who he was. That was in the late 80s before I took his picture. When he would phone me, he would say, hello, it's me. I would say, hello, me, this is me. And he would chuckle. I knew that I needed to feed his ego because I felt that would help keep me alive. I didn't want to be an object. I needed to be someone he wanted to keep talking to. I told him that he and I could have a nice relationship if it wasn't for his one bad habit. He liked that because he laughed, but not loudly. Each night around 3 a.m. as I drove the 47 miles home, I would be followed. That helped to save my life because before that I would fall asleep while driving. I drank coffee at work before driving home to try to stay awake, but that didn't work 90% of the time. Once I knew I had a crazy stalker following me each night, that kept me alert. He would try to force me off the road by laying back, then speed up to my bumper. He did this a few times, so one time when he sped up and was close to my bumper, I tapped my brake just enough for him to see the brake lights. He went out of control and ended up sideways on a hill next to the highway. I mean, where are the police reports here? If this guy's running her off the highway daily, I mean, what's going on here? One other time, on a drizzly and foggy night at about 2 a.m. when I was on 880 Freeway in Oakland, a car similar to a silver Honda passed me and stopped at the entrance of the exit I had to take to get home. I had to slam on my brakes to keep from hitting him and spun around on the slippery pavement a few times, fortunately escaping injury to myself and others, yet managing to continue. I am sure that made him angry that his plan fell apart. One of the females that I feel he ran off the road and then stabbed her to death near his car was Teresa Brown, who was also a waitress working in Walnut Creek and who lived in Antioch. She was forced off Highway 4 in Pittsburgh, California on April 22, 1988, where many other women were being murdered by a serial killer that has yet to be caught. One of those females who got away from the killer's long knife lived to tell me that the man I have the picture of was the man who tried to kill her. I mean, how many serial killers is Sandy Betts crossing paths with? Okay, so let's look at the Teresa Brown case. There's not a lot of information here. 
I did find this uh, write-up on the Highway 4 Murders, Wednesday, June 12th, 2013, by Truth and Soul on the ZodiacKillerSite.com forum. Post reads, I wanted to add some other victims that were found in the same area prior to and after Ignersol. Andrea Greeley Ignersol was found in a gully off a of canal road in West Pittsburgh. Found under a blanket in the wooded area, an anonymous caller tipped off authorities. And regarding the Ignersol case, I mean, we're going off on tangents off of tangents here, but here's an interesting post by Sandy Betts on the ZodiacKillerSite.com regarding Ignersol's murder possibly being linked with the Zodiac. What you are missing is a murder done with all of the Zodiac's M.O., do you know that the Zodiac liked killing near water or towns, streets, anything pertaining to water? He made phone calls to let police know where to find the victims. Holidays were important to him. This case has it all. What you don't know is that when I went to find any witness who may have seen the killer, I found one who told me the man was an older man in his 50s. That was in the early 1990s making him in his 30s in 1969. He pulled a long knife out from under his front seat and tried to stab her. I was told he had curly to wavy hair. Zodiac witnesses said curly wavy brown hair. He has a full round face. She said he was 5'8 to 5'10, hazel eyes, pot belly, barrel chested. If Zodiac is still alive, then this guy fits the description better than most I have read about. Pittsburgh is not very far from Vallejo. There were a total of 10 unsolved female murders in the 90s time frame in the Pittsburgh Antioch area. Don't forget that a card could have been from Zodiac. The Eureka Christmas card was sent December 1990. There were usually murders by Zodiac around the time of his letters and cards. If you are a believer that the Zodiac is dead or stopped killing and changed his ways after Paul Stein, then your mind is made up and you won't see the comparison. I believe that Zodiac is still alive and has not stopped killing, so whenever I see a murder that has all of the Z's M.O. surrounding it, I take a long look at it. Some follow-up posts here. Andrea having been found under a blanket suggests that her killer may have known her. Serial killers do not usually cover their victims, and Zodiac was no exception to that aspect. Which is a good point. I mean, that is a good point here. Also, if there were copycats of the Zodiac, that might account for some of these unsolved murders. So that was Ignersol, but here is the, uh, the write-up on Brown. So further victims prior to and after Ignersol, I don't necessarily believe that these are all or any of Zodiac victims, as I think most would agree. Also, I'll summarize the other known murderers that were operating in the area around the same time as I think it is helpful to eliminate possible Z victims as more likely victims of another killer. And that's an excellent point as well, because who's to say the Zodiac had the monopoly on murder? Obviously, the Zodiac killer did not. There were other murderers around. To give a little geographical background, Pittsburgh, Bay Point, and Antioch are just 20 minutes about 20 miles away from Lake Herman Road in Benicia across a narrow section of the bay. Highway 4 is the major route that connects all three cities. Another 40 miles to the east along Highway 4 is Stockton, which I'll also include some activities as it helps build some POIs. Prior to 1992, Bay Point was called West Pittsburgh if it shows up in any articles. I'll list the events in chronological order and post copies of several articles following this initial post. The first was Teresa Colleen Brown. Investigators believe she was run off the road into a ravine, Highway 4 at Willow Pass Road, and stabbed to death. Found by a CHP officer in the morning, Feb uh, April 22nd, 1988. She was on her way home in Antioch from her job in Walnut Creek, 15 minutes south, late at night. If any, this one sounds like the most Z-like, in my opinion. The next two are Sharon Matos, who was found July 18, 1992 in Pittsburgh, and Andrea Ignersal, found November 12, 1992 in West Pittsburgh, now Bay Point. I've found few details on Sharon Matos, and the article in the aforementioned Ignersal post gives her cause of death as traumatic injury. These two were described as prostitutes, which matches a characteristic of most of the later area murders. 
A big jump to 1998 leads to the most well-documented of the unsolved murders in the area, 15-year-old Lisa Diane Norell, found dead by apparent asphyxia on November 6, 1998. At some point, there were two men in custody, David Michael Hennaby Jr. and Gary Lee Walton, based on a lead derived from a deal with accused child molester Dwayne Shoemake. I don't know if that's uh, a typo if it's supposed to be Shoemaker, who was a local fire chief at the time. Ultimately, the two men were released. I mean, it's weird. Authority-worshipping cultists never want to consider that there are people in positions of authority, whether it be fire department, police department, child protective services, any of these other agencies. I mean, there are humans out there that are criminals. They are in all professions. That's just the way it is. If you weren't born yesterday, you know that. Just following the Norell murder, the activity picks up. The next is Michael Tan, one of the most obscure of the lot due to being male, I presume, found bludgeoned and ultimately drowned in Pittsburgh, November 9th, 1998. He sticks out as neither a prostitute, apparently, nor being from the area, from, from Walnut Creek, 15 minutes due south. Yeah, I mean, does that really fit the M.O.? Drowning? There's a documented attempted kidnapping in Antioch on November 19, 1998. The next four, along with Lisa Norell, are the ones presented in the most articles about the string of Highway 4 murders. December 5, 1998, Jessica L. Frederick was found in Pittsburgh, stabbed to death. Her boyfriend, Mohamed Niaz, was a suspect. December 5th, also... Uh, so that was December 5th. The next two are December 15th, 1998. Tammy Davis found in a Bay Point outhouse, severely beaten but alive. She'll never be at full capacity again, was a quote from a detective. Also that day, Rachel Cruz found strangled and smothered in Pittsburgh. Same day. January 8th, 1999, the series apparently ends with Valeria Don China Schultz found stabbed and strangled in Bay Point. There are a few names that haunt the area, Joseph Nasso, Roger Kibbe, Daryl Kemp, Charles Jackson, and Philip J. Hughes, but their convictions and or incarcerations, except for the currently on trial Nasso, make them difficult or impossible to connect to the above murders, particularly the later ones. Philip Garrido, who was sentenced in 2011 for kidnapping and sexual assault of J.C. Lee Dugard, he lived in Antioch from 1988 after being paroled for a prior rape. His initial arrest in 2009 prompted a new investigation into the above murders with a focus on the murder of Lisa Norell. How popular is Antioch? Okay, so apparently Antioch is relatively popular. It's this, currently the second largest city in Contra Costa County, California. 2020 population was 115,291. By contrast, Pittsburgh, 72,437 in 2018. This is California. So, yeah, I mean, I was about to say, if it was if it was a really, really low population, that would be a, even more suspicious, just regarding all these individuals that happen to be in and around Antioch. But continuing on here, in 2008, William Jennings Choice of Stockton was convicted of the murder of Lawanda Back, found July 2nd, 97, in Stockton. Gwendolyn Lee, found August 11th, 97 in Stockton. And Victoria Bell, found April 3rd, 8, 1988 in Oakland. Wow, that's a, so that's a, a nine-year difference there. And had all three were known prostitutes and had been raped and shot. Choice has been incarcerated since 2002 for two rapes, 94 and 2001, prior to the three homicide convictions. Yeah, there's a lot of crime going on here. I mean, this is some scary stuff. So here's an article from Contra Costa Times, March 19, 2000, regarding Teresa Brown. This is pretty much most of the information available online. There's not a lot here. Written by Christy Belcamino. In 1988, darling girl is stabbed. An investigator is convinced a woman living in Antioch was killed by someone she knew. The sun was just beginning to swell above the hills when the California Highway Patrol officer noticed the black skid marks on eastbound Highway 4 at Willow Pass Road. Peering down into a ravine from the side of the road, he spotted the two-door brown Mercury Montego. It was upright but facing the wrong direction. 
When he reached the bottom of the ditch, the officer found the car empty and the passenger side window broken out. He found the bloody body of a 30-year-old woman in a thicket of bamboo about 15 feet away. Teresa Colleen Brown had been stabbed to death. Nearly 12 years later, her slaying remains unsolved. While investigators have not determined a motive, Contra Costa County Sheriff Sergeant Mark Hale said he does not believe it was a random killing. We don't feel this is a stranger who did this, he said. This is not a wandering hobo hitchhiker who jumped off a train. This was someone in the area. Brown's mother, Louis Prolx of Antioch, remains eager to find out who killed her daughter. It would mean everything to me, she said, if I knew who it was and he was executed. I'd be there to watch him. I would want him punished. She even wrote then-governor Pete Wilson asking him to offer a reward for information about her daughter's death, but to no avail. Prolx described her daughter as a darling girl devoted to her children. Brown liked to go out on Friday nights and loved to laugh. After separating from her husband, Brown left Oregon in January 88 and moved to her mother's house in Antioch with her youngest, a four-year-old boy, in tow. Her then-husband, who still lives in Oregon and was living there with their two older children when she died, is not a suspect, Hale said. Their youngest son lives with his father now. At the time of her death, Brown had worked for about two weeks as a cocktail waitress at the Ramada Renaissance Hotel in Walnut Creek. She had a tough facade, but was also described by co-workers as very friendly and outgoing, Hale said. Brown seems to have made most of her acquaintances in bars. And some of these casual friends were biker types, Hale said. Brown's sister, Mary Knibb, had said Brown was carefree and innocent but began hanging out with a tough crowd shortly after moving to Antioch. Still, on most nights, Brown went straight to the babysitter's house to pick up her little boy after her work shift ended, Hale said. On the night of her slaying, Brown did not mention that she had other plans, and the babysitter expected to pick her to pick up her son. She never showed up. Brown was last seen at 2.15 a.m., April 22, 1988, when she left work. Her body was discovered at 6.30 a.m., other hotel employees told police there had been no problems with customers that night, and several had watched Brown get into her car and leave alone, Hale said. He believes she met her killer somewhere later. There were signs that Brown had sexual contact after leaving work, but Hale doesn't know if it was with the killer or someone else. I wonder if they have DNA. What Hale said he does believe, though, is that before Brown's killer stabbed her, he terrorized the 30-year-old, chasing her down the freeway and running her car off the road. After the crash, the killer hiked down into the ravine after her. Before she was stabbed, Brown had either been dragged out of the car, Hale said, or she was already out of the car and trying to run away. Prowlx and Nib both said they believe Brown was killed because she knew something the killer didn't want her to know. Hale said this was one of several possible motives detectives have considered. So there's really not a lot of other information here regarding the Teresa Brown case. Sandy also posted on ZodiacKillerMystery.Freeforms.net. A couple posts here. During the 80s and 90s, the people of Contra Costa County had a serial killer who phoned the Pittsburgh Police Department to tell them where he dumped a body. That body was Andrea Ignersall. She was with my daughter just a few hours before she was killed. So, yeah, Sandy bets here. Between her and her daughter and her husband's ex-husband's ex-boyfriends and stalkers, I mean, is she connected to every aspect of the Zodiac Killer case? And how much definitive evidence does she have to prove this? Because she has some, but this is almost so mind-shocking that I don't know. I don't know what to make of this. So she said her daughter was with Andrea Ignersall. Even though the killer told them where to find her body and then told him he was the Zodiac and was responsible for over a dozen females during the time the call was ignored. And I'm not sure how Sandy found this out. Some believe that Art Allen was the Zodiac and that he had died. Many people in law enforcement believed Zodiac was dead. So the Pittsburgh police felt that the person calling had to be just a hoaxer. After all, no one had heard from the Zodiac in years. Most of the girls murdered were prostitutes, a few were not. During the time, I took particular interest in the murder of a waitress named Teresa Brown who lived within a few blocks of me. She and I, both being waitresses, worked late at night and drove the same highway to get home. In fact, on April 22nd, 88, the night she was killed, I was on that stretch of highway within 15 minutes of her murder. 
She was forced off the highway and then stabbed to death. Other women in Contra Costa County were reporting a man who followed them late at night in a green car. There were always women who were driving alone on dark country roads. He would flash his lights at them to try to get them to pull over, a lot like what was done in the Kathleen Johns case. They described him as looking Hispanic. Oddly enough, the man who tried many times to force me off that road also looked Hispanic. Uh, you know what's weird, though? If Sandy Betts, if her ex or stalker or whoever really is the Zodiac, is she, I mean, and if she lives in that area and there's a guy trying to force people off the road, I, I suppose it's theoretically possible that this guy trying to force people off the road is not the Zodiac, but there's a lot of people, that's a highly populated area. So there could have been people who crossed his path, in, including people who knew the Zodiac, like Sandy Betts. I mean, theoretically, statistically, it's, it's actually, that's, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Theoretically, it's possible. A thread started a few years ago about Teresa Brown's case. Okay. Sandy Betts also mentions that this, uh, these Highway 4 deaths, two years after Koi Ian Sechow and Choi Fao Se Lee, who were killed by a freeway. Also, Michael Tan in 98 and Sylvia Valdivia in 2007, who was stabbed. More, another post by Sandy here. I've been looking over some of my Z collections, found the article about the three different women who were followed late at night by a man in a green sedan in Marsh Creek Road, Vasco Road, and J4. The article was in the Contra Costa Times, January 1st, 94. Say what you will about Sandy Betts. If she's making all of this up, I mean, she must have been, re she must have been so well researched in order to make things up that happened to align with all of these articles that matched where she was living and working and all these things. The title of the article, Police Warn of Man Trying to Run Women Off Rural Roadways. An unknown man is apparently trying to run women off rural East County roads, warns the Contra Costa Sheriff's Department. The department is warning women driving the area to be careful and not to stop for anyone. In three separate incidents, women driving alone have been threatened by another driver. We have had about three incidents in the past three months, said Sheriff Sergeant Ed Johnson. He comes up from behind, flashes his light, and tries to turn them off the road. The most recent incident occurred 7.20 p.m. Wednesday. A Tracy woman was driving on Marsh Creek Road, saw a car come from behind her, blink its lights. When the woman did not stop, the man driving in the car pulled alongside the woman's car and tried to force her off the road. The offending vehicle could be a dark green sedan. However, night vision may have hampered witness descriptions, Johnson said. It's happened to women who have been riding alone at night, he said. Women should try to avoid the area. If they have to go there, they should try to have someone with them. Should they collide with another vehicle, don't stop, Johnson warned. Drive to the nearest public area where there are other people. There's one more article here, mercurynews.com. I'm convinced that you have at least one serial killer. 1998 East Bay killings remain a mystery. Pittsburgh detective hopes to crack 20-year-old cold cases. This was written by Judith Prieve. Relatively recent article here, December 28th, 2018. Pittsburgh. Frustrated over trying to learn a difficult dance step, Lisa Diane Norell left a late night quinceanera rehearsal at the IDES Hall in Antioch. Black heels and dark blue velvet dress in hand and walked down a dark stretch of the Pittsburgh Antioch Highway, presumably to her home four miles away. Wow, really? She does four miles walks like it's nothing back in 98? Interesting. I mean, how many people today walk four miles back and forth to a dance rehearsal? The 15, but the 15-year-old Pittsburgh High sophomore never made it. Her asphyxiated body, hands clenched into fists, was found face down eight days later, November 14, 1998, near a Pittsburgh landscaping business on the same highway. Lisa was the first of four young men, women killed within two months in Pittsburgh in late 98, early 99. The killings not only devastated the small close-knit community, but also rocked the surrounding cities, setting off fear that a serial killer might be living in their midst. 
Today, 20 years later, Pittsburgh Police Lieutenant Jacob Stage is trying to reignite interest in the killings, hoping someone will remember something that might help investigators solve these cases, which have never been closed. Stage also has sent back the forensic evidence to the lab, hoping new technology will reveal something that was not evident before. Because we are on the 20-year anniversary of these series of homicides, I really wanted to do a big push to see if we could get more information from the public, said Stage, who has been posting the victims' stories on the police Facebook page. I think somebody knows or can lead us in the right direction just on their hunch. Within two months, police found the bodies of Jessica L. Frederick, 24, Rachel Cruz, 32, both in Pittsburgh, and Valerie Don China Schultz, 27, nearby in Bay Point. Michael Tan, 29, was also found bludgeoned and drowned in Pittsburgh, November 9, 98. A Concord resident, he was the only man and non-local person in the string of killings. So perhaps not related if he got into a fight with somebody. Hmm. It was... A time that former Contra Costa County DA Inspector Paul Holes remembers well. Famous for his work in catching the suspected Golden State Killer, Holes said that these killings were his highest priority during his career with the DA and Sheriff's offices. He remains confident that one person was responsible for at least some of the killings. I'm convinced that you have at least one serial killer who was at work that killed some of these women, but I can't say that one person killed all of them, Holes said. It's sad to think it's the 20th anniversary. I know there has been a lot of effort put in to solve that case and unfortunately hasn't panned out just yet. Stage, Pittsburgh lead homicide detective, is hoping that this time, with advances in DNA tech, the department will get a hit like Antioch Police did last year that helped solve the case of Suzanne Bombardier, a 14-year-old Antioch girl who was kidnapped and murdered 37 years earlier. So that was 1980. And she was found floating in the San Joaquin River east of Antioch. Antioch resident Mitchell Lynn Baycom, first degree murder, 1980 killing, 14 year old Suzanne Bombardier. So he was uh, convicted. He was 67 years old at the time of his conviction. This is a March 17, 2022 article. SanFrancisco.CBSLocal.com referencing this. So he was on parole at the time of Bombardier's murder in 19... Okay, wow. In 1980, Bacom was convicted in a separate sexual assault case with other felonies. So if this guy was mostly in prison, I guess he couldn't have been involved with at least the majority of the other possible suspected Zodiac killings. Continuing on here, maybe that minuscule amount that wasn't detected before is going to be detected this time, Stage said. DNA testing has increased so much over the last 20 years that I'm hoping we find something that was overlooked. Stage was assigned the cold case six months ago and has been poring over the files ever since Lisa's is the largest, nearly 10 times the size of a regular homicide file, and Stage has checked back on nearly every lead that came in 20 years ago. Although the Pittsburgh detective said all unsolved cases are important, Lisa's case stands out because of the circumstances and her young age. Any case that I get assigned is important to me, but this one does have special meaning because this poor 15-year-old girl was killed walking home and her mom never got to see her again, Stage said. All those other women had children and they didn't get to see them grow up. They're all horrible. Since Lisa disappeared in Antioch, police there originally handled her case, handing it over to Pittsburgh later when evidence was found there. I tip my hat to the Antioch Police Department. They went all out, Stage said. The day after she was missing, they already had bloodhounds out from Alameda and search and rescue out looking for her. They took this very, very seriously. They went from zero to 100 miles an hour. Lisa had no history as a runaway and was, and early on was listed as a missing person, he said, noting in an unusual move, the FBI got involved almost immediately. They were contacted right away and it was a huge, huge effort to try to find her, he said. I don't think there were any circumstances at the time that immediately red flags were going off. They took it upon themselves to make the proper calls. Everyone had assumed someone had given Lisa a ride home, so it wasn't until 3 a.m. when her mother, Minnie Norell, awoke to find her missing that a report was filed and police swung into action, Stage said. Bloodhounds the next day led police along the Pittsburgh Antioch Highway where her garment bag with her Quinceanera gown and dress shoes were found. One of the bloodhounds went very close to Navland where her body was later found, but those were dogs barking in the area and the handler thought that maybe he was keying in on those dogs. 
Stage said, noting that you would be found alongside a back building of the landscaping business during a second search a week later. Police did not say whether she was sexually assaulted, but her death was ruled as asphyxiation. No DNA was initially recovered, Stage said. Most people would have been spooked out by the long walk, but it's very doable for a young person. You are very brave when you are 15, Stage said. You'll take on the world. She, Lisa, was a fighter, a strong-willed young lady. Two months later, Gary Lee Walton, 39, and David Michael Hennaby, 24, both who had extensive criminal records, were arrested on suspicion of killing Lisa, but they were later released. What evidence, if any, was found during search warrants at their homes remains sealed, but Stage said he doesn't believe they are the killers. Why would it be sealed all this time later? I mean, do they want to solve these cases or not? Whoever is responsible, Lisa's aunt, Kathy Russo, is hoping he is caught. Her sister-in-law, Minnie Norell, died five years ago and never got any closure on her only child's death. She had adopted Lisa, a native of Guadalajara, Mexico, when she was just a baby. Lisa really deserves some justice, Russo said. Everything was going right for her. She had been babysitting. She had enough money to buy a computer. She was so proud of herself. She was becoming such a lovely young woman. Russo said the Quintanero, a Mexican coming-of-age ceremony, was for one of Lisa's best friends. Her decision to leave was abrupt. Someone was making fun of her dancing, Russo said of that fateful night. It was just a silly, stupid mistake on her part. Minnie dropped her off, and the mother said they would bring her home. Lisa got upset, took her shoes and dress, and walked out the door, and nobody went after her. Wow, this is even more heartbreaking. I mean, this just... Uh, although Russa said her sister-in-law was devastated, she was a kind soul and didn't blame anyone. It was overwhelming, but so many people in Pittsburgh were so kind, Russo said. There was overwhelming support. Minnie talked about her all the time. She missed her daughter every day. It broke her heart. Only two days after Lisa's disappearance, the body of Michael Tan was found along North Parkside Drive on November 9th. He was face down in a ditch and had been beaten and drowned. His Concord apartment had been burglarized the day before, and police believe he was killed and later dumped in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, that could have been unrelated. I would also like to see the averages of homicides in that area, because if there really weren't a lot, and then there were these two within two days of each other, I mean, that would make it a little bit more suspicious. But if there are homicides relatively frequently in the general vicinity, I mean, I don't know. Less than a month later, December 5th, Jessica Frederick, 24, was found dead in an industrial area near an auto wrecking yard on Harbor Street and Industry Road in Pittsburgh. Her body had been dumped alongside a road used mostly by trucks and employees of wrecking yards and salvage businesses. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. Frederick's boyfriend, Mohamed Niaz, was charged with murdering her, but the charges were dismissed in 2001 and he is no longer considered a suspect. Nine days later, Rachel Cruz, a 32-year-old mother of two who battled drug addiction and lived near an area known for prostitution, was found strangled in a ditch off California Avenue near Antioch Building Materials. That same day, a 38-year-old woman with a record of prostitution was found badly beaten in a portable toilet in Bay Point. At the time, she was only able to provide a limited description of her attacker, a Hispanic male driving a dark Monte Carlo. The victim never regained full capacity and has since died, stage said. Here's the thing, though. Isn't the M.O. to kill? So is this just a disgruntled John who just beat her because he's messed up? I mean, unless she was beaten so severely to the point of unconsciousness, he really thought she was dead and she wasn't? Other than that, I mean, what again, do we have a, a baseline here? How many prostitutes were found beaten that year? If she was the only one, I mean, okay. I mean, I don't know how many police reports there would be of that, depending on the severity, but... On January 8, 1999, the body of Valerie Dawn China Schultz, 27, who had a history of prostitution, was found in a ditch along a desolate stretch of Willow Pass Road near the Pittsburgh Bay Point border. Holes said some of the killings had similarities that pointed toward a single perpetrator, but refused to get into the specifics. I have to remain very vague, Holes said. We're aware that there are some unique aspects in what was done to these women that we don't want released to the public. Here's the thing, though. Like, how many decades need to go by? I mean, does a century need to go by? If they're not solving the case, I mean, the perpetrators will be dead in a century. 
So what's the point of keeping this so secret if there's no hope for closure? It's just, it's really weird. There needs to be some kind of statutes of limitations on withholding information. Because all the relatives of these people are going to be long gone. I mean, what's the point? Peter Vronsky, a historian and author with a focus on serial killings, said killers often change their methods. He said geographical profiling is one of the most reliable ways to pinpoint a killer's residence. Geographic patterns can indicate where the perpetrator feels comfortable operating, Vronsky said. Usually that will be an area he's familiar with. Over the years, police have looked into area parolees and registered sex offenders as well as known criminals such as Philip Garrido, who lived just doors down from a relative of Lisa's, and Mitchell Lynn Baycom, who last year was charged in a 37-year-old Antioch case. No connections were made, however. Stage has gone back and interviewed prostitutes who frequented the areas where most of the bodies were dumped and even talked with some who knew the victims. I think those women who were killed were so street smart that they weren't going to fall victim to that, a killer, Stage said. It's sad because most were so street smart. Maybe he was a previous customer. In Lisa's case, the killer might have mistaken her age and situation in the dark, but by the time he picked her up, it was too late, Stage said. The area where these women were found were common places where prostitution activities occurred, he said. It could have been someone who used their services at some point and maybe later decided he wanted to go sideways, or it could be four individual people. You have to keep your options open. The Pittsburgh detective is hoping that someone who saw something or has a hunch about a person but has never said anything before will step up this time. It's never too late and no tip is too silly to pass on, he said. People that were traveling the, down the Antioch-Pittsburgh Highway at the time might have seen something. Any suspicious vehicles at the time, he said. I do believe there is someone out there who always thought it was a weird co-worker or that black sheep of the family, but maybe held back on calling because they didn't want to bother the police department back then. Anyone with information on this cold case homicide is encouraged to contact Detective Stage, 925-252-6972. So, yeah, he sounds like he's keeping options open. Another thing, if there was some kind of occult connection, which uh, we'll be doing a dedicated episode on that as well, is it possible there's more than one individual operating in this occult cult, and they know about each other? Some of them performed certain murders, some of them performed others. And that's why it's so difficult to solve, because it really isn't just one guy. All right, so let's go all the way back to the Sandy Betts account on ZodiacCiphers.com after our Highway 4 murders aside. Yeah, I mean, this Zodiac case has so many rabbit holes. My youngest son, Bobby, was dating a girl from Walnut Creek named Trish. She had heard him mention that I was being stalked by a man who could be the Zodiac killer. She said she had a Zodiac book she had read, and if I wanted it, she would give it to me. Of course I wanted it. We planned to meet up at Lyons Restaurant where she gave me the book. I bought her lunch and drove her back to Walnut Creek. Soon after that meeting, she started to get phone calls from an older sounding man who told her that if she didn't stop dating my son, he would kill them both. He would watch her because he knew when she was home alone and would call to let her know. He would watch her at her job and call to tell her that he saw her there and describe what she was wearing. Thank goodness she reported all of this. This was before I took his picture, so I couldn't show her what he looked like to forewarn her. There is no doubt in my mind that he was my stalker. It was a good thing she made a police report, as that may have saved both of their lives. You know what's weird here? Is this, if this is really one guy, like how much time, like first of all, what is this guy's job? That he has time to stalk two different people almost round the clock, or possibly even more people? Okay, I mean... What is the, how many people on average does a stalker stalk? Are there numbers on this? Remember Walnut Creek was the town where Elaine Davis was kidnapped. On December 1st, uh, Elaine Davis, 17, 19, uh, December 1st, 1969, December 1st, 1969, Elaine Davis, 17 years old, disappeared from her home in Walnut Creek, Contra Costa County, California, abducted in the evening time through a sliding rear window. 
Two and a half weeks later, on December 19, 69, her body was discovered floating off Lighthouse Point, Santa Cruz, California. However, due to investigators misinterpreting the age of the victim at the time, her identity was only realized 31 years later when officials exhumed the body in 2000. Wow, that's really sad. Elaine's father worked at a Volkswagen dealership. Elaine was taken while her mother drove to pick up her father from work. She must have been being watched by her kidnapper for a while for him to know when it would be safe to grab her. The phone calls continued. I suspected someone was on the other end because I could hear him breathing and sometimes play music for me. Two songs I remember were Every Day I Get the Blues and I Got You Babe by Sonny and Cher. They were recorded on my phone recorder, as were many of my phone calls. Cards would sometimes be put in my mailbox. One was a green card with an Irish leprechaun on it and the name Patrick's or St. Patrick's Flooring. In Robert Graysmith's Zodiac book, there was no mention of Darlene Farron's birthday being on St. Patrick's Day. This card reminded me of her birthday. Was my stalker giving me a clue to Darlene? Perhaps he was. I do believe he knew her very well and she him. He waited until after her death to reveal his name, Zodiac. Did she know that he used that name for himself so he couldn't use it until after Betty Lou and David? I believe that this stalker believed Darlene and I knew each other. She may have known me because I could have waited on her at the Coronado Inn, but I really don't remember knowing her. Did she know me because I was dating Buzz Gordon and she wanted to date her and she wanted him to date her more than the one night he told me he dated her? Your guess is as good as mine. The next striking date was January 15th, 1988. It was about 11 p.m. when a group of people came in and put a few of the small cocktail tables together. There were about eight people in the group. At the head of one of the tables sat an older-looking man with a shaved head, horn-rimmed glasses, thin dark mustache, nicely dressed. Next to him on his left was an older-looking woman that could have been Dorothy Puente's twin sister. She was a female serial killer from Sacramento who was caught a few years later. There was one Asian woman who I believe was a waitress at the Box Inn in Oakland's Chinatown on Webster Street. The man she was with asked for vodka on the rocks. I told him he had drunk too much and I could only give him coffee. I took the rest of their drink orders and asked the man at the head of the table for his order, to which he replied, Bailey's, Amaretto, and coffee. I took a few steps and turned around when I felt some tension coming from the man. I then asked him if he wanted his drink made like an Irish coffee or a shot of Bailey's, a shot of Amaretto, and coffee on the side. He said he would like an Irish coffee. At that moment, I thought how odd that this man had asked for a drink like one I had invented up on the Delta years before. I did notice that this man had very shiny shoes and had on dark wool navy-like pants similar to the description offered by Kathleen Johns. His shoes were so shiny that the candles on my tabletops were reflecting off of them. During Kathleen Johns' ordeal in the car, she recalled his highly polished shoes reflecting the yellow lights from the car interior. I thought that I might be going crazy thinking that this guy could be Zodiac, because he had clothes on and shiny shoes just like I had read about in the Zodiac book. He even had the headband Kathleen mentioned her abductor was wearing. It was also the tension I felt. When I asked, when I turned to ask him about his drink order, did he think I recognized him as my stalker? I tried to not think he could be Zodiac, but asked an off-duty cop friend of mine to look at him and to remember what he looked like because I did believe he was the man who had been following me. My friend, Ted G, re reassured me. I went with my strong gut feeling anyway. The final nail in the coffin was when I went to see if anyone at those tables wanted another drink. He and a few others did. He politely asked the woman to his left if she wanted another plain Coke. She didn't. While I was at my station waiting for the bartender to take my order, the older man came up behind me and touched my shoulder. I let out the loudest scream ever but he didn't even flinch, seemingly unperturbed by the scream. We were toe-to-toe -to -toe at that point, and he said to me in a very robotic-sounding voice as if he was reading, similar to what Nancy Slover recalled on July 5th, 1969. I am very sorry if I frightened you. 
It was the most monotonous sounding voice I had ever heard. I was so very sure at that point I was standing in front of the Zodiac Killer, and no one could convince me otherwise. He was a short man, approximately 180 pounds, but not fat. His teeth were very stained from chain smoking. I did see a scar, like an L-shaped scratch on his left cheek, and a circular scar on his right cheek. He had light powder all over his head, face, and hands. He didn't look at all like the man I got away from in 1968. So before people just write this off, I mean, isn't the statistic that's floated around that the average person in their lifetime will meet a, or cross paths with a serial killer at least once? What if you're living in an area where there's one or two serial killers operating? Would your chances go up, especially if it's a place that the serial killer frequents? Meanwhile, Adrian, the cook from across the parking lot at the 400 Club, came in and sat next to my station. I told him that I would like for him to watch me when these people leave because I was going to follow the man with the shaved head outside to get his license plate number. I told him that I was pretty sure this was the man who had been calling and following me. Adrian suggested that he could do it for me, although I had serious reservations about him getting involved. Adrian assured me he could do it without the man knowing, and besides, Adrian was very pro proficient in memorizing numbers. To this day, I wish I hadn't accepted his assistance of help because eight months later, on my birthday, in 1988, Adrian was stabbed, disemboweled, and left for dead in Oakland. His friends had told me about it, so I tried to find which hospital he was in, but I couldn't find him, probably because it was an attempted murder. What the heck? It was a year later in 1989 that Adrian came in to Pier 29. I gave him a hug and asked him if the man who attacked him was the man he followed outside for me. He said he couldn't talk about it. The police officer friend of mine, Ted G, who was at Pier 29 the night I saw my head shaved stalker, had a boat in Alameda Marina. I would stay on his boat whenever there was too much fog to drive home. He was always a gentleman, but wasn't afraid of anyone. On the night of January 12, 1990, Ted's birthday, he came into Pier 29 with two friends, one male, one female. They left about 2 a.m. closing time. He and his two friends went to his boat, which was kept in a secure locked boat dock. Next to his boat, he saw a man wearing a knit watch cap and a heavy coat wiping down the boat next to his. He was happy to finally meet his neighbor. He introduced himself to the man and invited him to join them for a glass of wine. Whatever that man said to them, scared them so much that Ted called my home at 3 a.m. and left a phone message on my recorder and told him that the man who I showed him at Pier 29 in January 1988 was crazy and evil. I got home shortly after that and called Ted back. Ted didn't answer, which worried me immensely, so I kept calling and still no answer. Finally, I called the Alameda Police Department and asked them if they could check on Ted to see if he was okay. They called me back saying he had been asleep but was perfectly fine. When I caught up with Ted, he told me I needed to be very careful of that man, as there was something very scary about him. He warned me to stay away from him, that he is dangerous. He never did say what the conversation was about, only that it was hard to understand the guy and that he sounded real crazy. But for sure, he was the man, I pointed out, as my stalker. The following year, I sent Ted G a birthday card, inside of which I included a photograph of one of my suspects I had taken in August of 1990. The one with the thick curly hair, not the shaved head one. He's, so she has up to three stalkers, I'm assuming here. He said that he didn't receive it. A few months later, on March 17th, Darlene's birthday, I received one of the pictures in an envelope. There was no return address, but it had been mailed in Oakland. The address was printed just like the Zodiac Killer. I am not sure if this was the picture I had mailed to Ted or if it was one of the pictures that I handed out to the females who were being murdered in Pittsburgh, California in the late 80s, early 90s. Was it from the killer letting me know that he had killed another one of the girls who I had give, given a picture to? I may never know that answer. It was Easter Sunday, April 3rd, 1988, and I was working the day shift. A young woman sat next to my station and we were talking about our clothes and how closely we were dressed. We both had on black skirts, black high heels, and silk blouses. She had on a pink jacquard material with a shiny pink flower design on it, open at the front. Mine was lavender with a high neck. 
I had looked for one more like hers but didn't find one, so I asked her where she had bought it. She told me it was a dress shop in Alameda, Foxy Lady or something like that. I don't remember what she was drinking because I didn't serve her. The bartender, Hal, did. I believe the time was about 3.30 or 4 p.m. because it wasn't so busy that I couldn't spend time talking to her. The bartender was concerned about the man sitting at the end of the curved bar from where he could see us talking. I was advised to walk her to a car when she left because Hal didn't like the way the man was glaring at us. I didn't recognize that man as he didn't look anything like the one with the shaved head. He did look like a very angry man, somewhat familiar, but I didn't make a connection at the time with the man I had seen in Vallejo, Napa in 1968. I don't remember asking the young woman what her name was. I wish I had. When she went to leave, I walked, her, I walked with her, but before she got to the exit, she decided to use the ladies' room next to the exit. I waited a bit for her to come out, but then two more customers walked in and I had to take their order. When I was back, she was gone, and so was the angry-looking man. There were two homicides that I discovered in Oakland, one being a woman with no identification wearing a black skirt, black high heels, and a pink blouse. The other was up on Skyline Boulevard in Oakland Hills. Within a few days of those murders, someone wanted me to know about them and neatly cut out the articles from a, new, from a few newspapers for me to see. They were put on my cocktail tray while I was in the kitchen area getting coffee. On top of the neatly folded stapled articles was a quarter with the number nine on one side of it. And on the other side was a circle on the outer edge of the quarter and a cross that went through to the edge of the circle like the Zodiac's logo. It was crafted using indelible ink. No one saw the person who left that for me. As it turned out, one of the women with the pink blouses was named Victoria Bell. Now, the strange thing about this is that the Oakland Police Department felt it was someone else that killed Victoria Bell. Seems like one heck of a coincidence to me that one possible serial killer follows her outside and some other serial killer murders her. Sorry, but I think there is something very wrong with that picture. I saw Victoria Bell's crime scene. I did not see any blood near her head, and yet the man who was found convicted of killing her shot all of his victims in the head. William Jennings Choice was found guilty of the 1988 murder of Victoria Bell, along with the 1997 rapes and murders of Stockton woman Lawanda Beck and Gwendolyn Lee. You know what's weird, too? If there was a mistake in some of these other cases, and they really did belong to Zodiac but they nailed other guys for them just to try to close cases. I mean, these kinds of errors, if they are errors, I mean, that definitely could have prevented some cases from being solved. And even possibly the Zodiac being found. There had to be good reason for the number nine to be put on that quarter. So I thought about it and remembered that my stalker connected Darlene to me for whatever reason. Darlene had been shot with a nine millimeter. Then I realized that the ninth letter of the alphabet was I, inferring it was him, I being Zodiac. He wanted me to believe he was Zodiac and that he killed both of these women. I wasn't showing any fear, whereas he needed me to know that I should be very fearful because he was in fact a Zodiac. Anyway, that is what I perceived it to be. And let me interject here again, because if this is a, some kind of sicko stalker, possibly a murderer, possibly not, and he wants people to think he's Zodiac, even if he's not. Does that explain everything? The angry-looking man with the thick, curly hair was still coming into my work almost every night, but Ron, the private investigator, could never get there in time to see him. See, you know, that, that's kind of weird, too, because if he knows he's coming there every night, why would he not just uh, take a cab there, or whatever, get there without using his personal vehicle that would be spotted outside? And just wait, because if it's almost every night, I mean, ah, uh, and if this is going on over a period of months, I mean, something's weird about this story. But anyway, it was January 1990, and I had two tickets to go to a crab feed in Walnut Creek. I wanted to go, but I knew it was too dangerous to go alone, so I asked one of my male customers, Frank, if he would like to join me. He said he would. However, I knew I needed to tell him that whoever the stalker was, he could possibly shoot at us while I was driving, but he wasn't worried about it. I said that he would need to spend the night at my home because I didn't want to drive back to Oakland and then back to my home alone. He was a smoker, so I asked him to please open his bedroom window while he smoked. In the morning, I decided to leave early so that whoever was following me wouldn't see us leave. 
I also phoned the police to ask if they would drive by in case the man was waiting to act as a deterrent. That took too long, so we left. We were going to have breakfast at Nico's on 29th Avenue across the street from Pier 29. It didn't seem like we were followed, but within five or ten minutes, my secret admirer walked into Nico's. For him to know I was there, he had to have followed me. He had on a rust-colored sweater, the same one he had worn when he came into my work in drag. So this guy's also a drag queen. Interesting. His hair was different, it was combed with a part on the left, and it was flattened down with something that took away the curls. But I knew it was him just the same. I acted as though I didn't recognize him so he wouldn't know. I also didn't mention it to Frank right then because I knew Frank would look over at him and he would know. I waited until the man got up from the counter and walked past me towards the restroom and the public phone area behind me. As I was telling him that, the man must have stopped behind him because Frank's eyes were looking above my head at him. The man then went around the corner. He wasn't gone long enough to use either the restroom or the phone. He just wanted a closer look at Frank, I guess. I did notice that he was pretending to be reading the yellow Zodiac paperback book. I am sure he did this as a taunt. Frank got up to pay the bill and was looking in my purse, thinking about carefully pulling out my gun so he could see it and then putting it in my jacket pocket. But I was worried that if anyone else saw it, like the off-duty cop sitting at the end of the counter, I would be taken away in handcuffs. Besides, I had a small can of mace in my pocket. I could see the man was walking towards me again, knowing that I was leaving. I turned toward the door, so he stood in front of me as if to block my leaving. He had his hand in his right hand pocket and was holding something. With his left hand, he held the Zodiac book up as to block anyone seeing what was in his other hand. I turned away from him and took another look in my purse, then started to step again toward the door, but he stood in the way. This all took place in a matter of seconds. Then I guess he felt that he was drawing attention to himself and let me walk past him out the door. I told Frank to leave quickly and to lock his door right away. I unlocked my side and got in, and just as I hit my door lock, the man had his hand on my door. I backed out of the parking place with my knees knocking. I was very scared. I drove across the street to let Frank off at his truck and parked my car next to the Park Street Bridge, went into my work, and fell apart inside. I couldn't stop crying, and I knew that this would be my last day of work. The stalker was getting more and more brazen, and he didn't seem to care that all these people saw him. I called the other waitresses who would come in at 6... Why didn't she just mace him, though, when, when he got in her way? I mean, obviously, killing a guy, especially if you're not 100% sure if he's a killer or what his intentions are, if he's blocking her from moving, she could have just maced him. Then there'd be a police report that'd have his name. I mean, it's just... I don't know. I called the other waitress who would come in at 6 p.m. to replace me, and I asked her if she would come in two hours early so I could leave safely. I then phoned my boyfriend and asked him to bring his brother so his brother could drive my car to his house and my boyfriend could drive me to his home in Stockton. I am not sure if we stopped at my home so I could get any of my things to stay in Stockton or not, but these were the lengths I went to in order to be safe from this obsessed man. Now her... Okay, actually, I don't know. How old is her daughter now? So is her daughter no longer living at home or her sons? Or are they staying with her in Stockton? I'm assuming she wouldn't leave them at home alone. We told his brother to come and pick me up in the morning, but leave my car hidden in his garage. Somehow he didn't know I wasn't going home. I was going to Stockton, so he went to my home looking for me. He said he knocked on the front door, then climbed the fence to knock on my bedroom window, thinking I was still sleeping. He called his brother, telling him he was at my home, but I wasn't answering. That was when he found out I was in Stockton, so he drove there. I have no doubt that he didn't look behind him to make sure he wasn't being followed, because the next morning, my stalker drove by the house I was hiding at. I mean, this stalker really does have a lot of time on his hands, doesn't he? The reason I needed my boyfriend's brother to pick me up, I had an appointment with the San Francisco Police Department with Jim Deasy about my stalker possibly being the Zodiac. I brought with me a tall glass which my stalker drank a Bloody Mary out of. It was before we knew about DNA, but I knew it would have his handprints and fingerprints on it, which could prove either way if he was Zodiac or not. Deasy told me about two men who would be coming in to talk about their suspect after I left. I gave him the note with the printing. I was told by an expert that the printing on the note was too much like the Zodiac's printing to be his. 
What? It was too much to be his? I also gave a tape of his voice saying, quote, sorry I missed you. Well, I guess I will say goodbye. Don't worry, we will get together soon, end quote. And Sandy put here, regarding sorry I missed you, she thinks it's meaning the shot that he fired at her. I also gave him the ruler from Healed College that was left with the Lake Berryessa costume. I thought that everything I gave him was enough, if checked, to prove I was correct in saying that this man was a Zodiac killer. But because they had so many people saying that they knew who Zodiac is, you get tuned out along with all of the kooks. I did not mention the killer's costume in my car because it sounds too good to be true. I thought that by not mentioning it, he would at least listen to the rest of my story. I had no idea at the time of discovery that it was a costume worn by the killer. If I had any idea what it was, I would have taken it to Napa Police Department immediately. It was many years later that I realized what was put in our car in Napa County thanks to the Robert Graysmith's drawing of the Lake Berryessa costume in his first Zodiac book. As soon as I saw that's what I had put away in a box of material, I started to look for it. After searching for it and not finding it, I thought it had been thrown out by my daughter-in-law who believed she was doing me a favor by cleaning out my garage. Either that or a renter I had in the 80s who sold things at flea markets had taken some of my belongings to sell. Later, I received a call from my ex-husband. He told me he had just moved and found some boxes of mine, and that his mother had been storing for us since 1977 after we moved. He knew they were mine because he knew I saved material for my sewing projects. I still do that to this day. He said that as soon as he goes through all of his boxes, he will let me know. I made the mistake of telling him how important the costume in one of those boxes was to me in the Zodiac case. I have not heard from him since that conversation. Okay. So that's, uh, that's pretty much her account here, summarized on ZodiacCiphers.com, taken from forum posts. She also responded to this post November 27th, 2017. I know that my stalker has a couple of friends and relatives. I have seen them with him. So certainly they could have a part in some of it, but he is the one behind it. I doubt that I have attracted several stalkers who play Z-like games for almost 50 years. My police file gets updated by my reports. The police are not taking this lightly. I can assure you of that. I have a great respect for law enforcement. I have recently, I have heard recently that my local police believe that Zodiac is or was living in my town. Sandy also made this interesting comment on uh, November 27, 2017, also regarding people calling her crazy. If Zodiac would have killed me, he wouldn't have had someone to have so much fun with. He likes taunting. I have other proof that is his handwriting and what I believe is Cecilia's wristwatch. Once I took his picture, he would be stupid to kill me because I, he knew I gave the picture to the police and they would put his face on TV. But to be smart, he knew that there would be idiots who wouldn't believe that he would allow a victim to live. You can think whatever you want, but you don't know anything about the real Zodiac. I get plenty of attention more than I like. I am not looking for attention. I don't need it. I am trying to get this killer stopped the best way I know how, more than any of what you are doing. Here's an excellent uh, post here, kind of summarizing the issues at play in the Sandy Bet story. I am sure Sandy is aware of all of the pitfalls of presenting her story to people. Sandy may correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe she may have been at the Napa bookstore when Mark Hewitt presented his first book to a gathered audience, and two women presented an account of being stalked by Zodiac. I cannot remember their account, but my guess is it points to a different Zodiac. I have also heard other accounts similar to which each and every individual is thoroughly convinced of their version. But likely... There being one Zodiac, my guess is that Sandy is skeptical to these other accounts, as they are to her account, and unfortunately here lies the problem. If we assume one is the correct version, then the others may be valid experiences, but not experiences of the Zodiac. I am sure Sandy listens to these other versions and believes these people are in all likelihood mistaken, and vice versa. 
We have a similar problem when it comes to suspects presented on forums. There are now hundreds of suspects, and each and every person is fully convinced they have unearthed the correct one. But clearly, at least all but one are incorrect. I mean, if there's only one Zodiac. The same applies to Cypher Solutions. Sandy is steadfast in her belief, but like Ray pointed out, and Sandy clearly realizes, the only thing that will nail this guy is solid evidence. And until the police get this, the speculation will only continue. As with other topics on this site, I welcome contributions from individuals, and as Sandy has personal experience of the locations of the Zodiac crimes, and been integral to the Zodiac circle for decades, it was important to incorporate her story into the fold. The one thing I take from this is that Sandy is very likely convinced that her stalker is Zodiac, and at the end of the day, that is all that matters. What I say isn't really going to change anything, and making a determination on an account without tangible evidence is impossible. As I have already stated, my guess is Sandy is likely skeptical to others' claims, as they are to her claims. And herein lies the problem. Listening or reading to 100 different versions of Zodiac stories, ciphers, and suspects ultimately leaves you back where you started, searching for that killer piece of evidence, which is still sadly lacking. Some obviously have more weight than others, but it's a case of objectivity and subjectivity. If I was a female of the correct age and lived in Northern California and presented a similar story to Sandy's, but altogether different and incompatible to the times and locations presented by Sandy, my guess is, and I don't want to put words in Sandy's mouth, is that she would believe I was mistaken in my belief that I was being stalked by Zodiac because Zodiac was stalking her. To determine if any are correct and founded in truth is nigh on impossible and unfortunately will remain just a subjective experience until proved otherwise. Sandy no doubt understands the problems and pitfalls of presenting such a story and I doubt anything or I or anybody else says will sway her belief. If you strongly believe something over decades, that then is what anybody else really thinks of any consequence. Follow up post here. I would be interested to hear Sandy's opinion on the possibility for the bulk of the events, obviously was aware of the Zodiac crimes and piggybacked the identity of Zodiac to instill fear into his prey. In the same way that the Zodiac letter hoaxers get a sick pleasure by imitating the killer, this stalker played a similar game to ramp up the terror. Additionally, but not in all cases, the climate of fear created during the Zodiac era creates an enhanced awareness of strange events and circumstances, and we are pattern-seeking humans looking for something to correlate our experiences to. And here's the thing, too. Let's say there was a group of Zodiac hoaxers and imitators. Maybe they never even killed anybody, but they were stalkers and criminal scumbags, and if there was a group of them just for kicks, they did all these things, including to Sandy as well as others, so multiple people could be telling technically the truth, but that doesn't mean this was the original Zodiac killer. Regarding the note that Sandy has that presented, and it seems like uh, it's in the exact Zodiac's handwriting, Sandy Betts wrote this about the note. My friend saw him write it at Lyon's restaurant in Antioch in 1987 or 1988 where I was living at the time. He did it rather fast, so I doubt that he was a copycat. One expert said it was too much like the Zodiac's writing to be from him. I mean, I don't know what that means. The writing is too identical, so it can't be him? I believe that this person who wrote it was hoping that I would recognize his writing and be scared. But I hadn't studied it yet to know that it looked like the Zodiac's writing. It was a few years later when I needed to use the purse that I left it in when I saw it again, and then I knew that it, it did look very much like Zodiac's printing. I knew that he gave me clues to check in that letter. One was the TV show People Are Talking. I checked it out. It was when Robert Graysmith was on telling about his Z book. This guy wanted me to get it so he could begin his game with me, but I had it already. I hadn't finished reading at the time. When I did, I was able to know when he would leave me clues to try and figure it out. Here's the thing, though. Zodiac, I mean, again, we really don't know who the Zodiac is, so he may or may not be completely insane or smart, stupid, versus lucky, or a combination of, of all of those things at different times. It seems like a Zodiac hoaxer or one of these Zodiac stalkers 
or if it's a Zodiac gang stalking club of some kind, it seems like they wouldn't be worried about attention going their way, right? If they're openly stalking people, they know that the police might show up or someone might beat them up or whatever. It seems like they're not really concerned about being taken in as the Zodiac, which it seems like they would not be the Zodiac in that case, unless the Zodiac is completely insane and he really doesn't care about the risk factor. Because for someone to be leaving notes like this or just going to someone's job every night, it seems, I mean, again, just based on all this surface level information, someone imitating the Zodiac didn't, wouldn't necessarily be concerned for their safety because they know they're not the original Zodiac who killed people. Now, if they also did kill people, that might make it less likely they'd be openly stalking people. I don't know. Okay, so I hope everybody's sitting down for this because th this is just stunningly mind-shocking. I mean, if this is true, we might have some smoking gun Zodiac information right here, right now. So all the Mind Shock listeners, listen up. Listen up. So here is the actual photo that Sandy Betts has taken of her stalker. Now, here's a couple things regarding the amount of individuals involved here. So Sandy Betts has said she had shown it. The photograph was shown with pictures of Larry Kane. The drawing shown above is pretty much what he looks like today. The SFPD composite with the age progression. The reason it's with Kane's picture is that that what was what I was told his name was from VPD and Harvey Hines. I don't know, does that look like Lawrence Kane? So from ZodiacKiller.com, here's a quick write-up on Kane. Lawrence Kane was born April 29th, 1924 in Brooklyn, New York. Cl Lawrence Klein was born April 29th, 1924, Brooklyn, New York. Klein would go on to use many aliases, including Larry Kane. Kane had a lengthy criminal rap sheet dating back to the 40s. Pam Huckabee, sister of Zodiac victim Darlene Farron, claims Kane followed Darlene's in months before her murder. Additionally, possible Zodiac victim Kathleen Johns identified Kane as her abductor. In 1969, during the peak of Zodiac's activity, Kane was 45 years old. He stood 5'9", weighed 160 pounds. His astrological sign is Taurus. As a result of massive brain damage, from a 1962 auto accident, Kane was allegedly diagnosed by a psychologist in 1965 as losing the ability to control self-gratification. Kane was arrested in Redwood City, California in August 68. The arrest was just four months before Zodiac's first San Fran Bay Area murder, December 20th, 1968. Kane died May 20th, 2010 in Reno, Nevada. So Kane's handwriting is here. Interesting. Here's his voice. This record is not endorsed by the United States Navy or any of its auxiliary organizations. Any similarity to persons living is almost as bad off as Eileen Barton. I would at this time like to take advantage of the fact that anyone who should be listening to this record cannot talk back to me and cannot interrupt my chain of thought. I would like at this time to make apologies for the record number one in this series entitled Galitzin Here I Come or Five Graves to Altoona. At the time of the making of the record, the young man who made it was under the influence of spirits of 76, but I'm sure it was 176, all straight, blues. When the train ride was over, he had the strangest idea that he had pulled the train all the way from New York by means of a rope tied to his hair. Oh, my head. <laughs> but to continue, he then went to this fine place and made a record that will set progress back 150 years. He then went to a hotel to sleep it off, all 176 of them. When he awoke, he realized the mistake he had made. He jumped on his pogo stick and rushed over to try to... 
He left no table unturned. In fact, he even swept the floor to get that, that. but it was all fail. All was gone. The die was cast. The fates had played their little game. So, as his setting sun sets beyond the isle of Puritaki Saki Faki, whatever it is, Island and his Sagittarian love, who is by birth under the sign of Zodiac, a hot tempered and very non understanding person, figures out these to torture him for his wrong. Not ordinary tortures, mind you, but fiendish, diabolical things like waiting for nine hours online to hear four girls in back of them blow them under their ass. Well, that's all he hopes and prays, is that some night, when she feels very, very lonely and in a very, very understanding mood, she will reason for that record and favor and destroy it. Cause here, the nobody ever seeing that again. Thank you very much, Anthony. Sign of Zodiac, sign of Zodiac, sign of Zodiac. So what's weird, I mean, his voice definitely has that monotone quality to it, as was reported. And apparently Kane does show up in one of the ciphers. What's weird, though, why would he reveal his name in the cipher unless he's framing someone else? Or if there is, I mean, actually, I don't know. Does this guy look like Lawrence Kane? I guess, it, I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's get this clarified. Sandy Betts' words here. So she has seen the photo alongside with pictures of Larry Kane. So the reason it is with Kane's picture is that that was what I was told his name was from VPD and Harvey Hines. In '68, when I first saw the man, his face was more round. It still is on the more round side than oval, but not as much as in 68. His hair was curly brown in 68, now more salt and pepper, but still pretty full for his age. His glasses are not horn rimmed. He wears wire rimmed glasses. The man who came to my job in January 88 is the one who wears the horn rimmed glasses and the rubber band to hold his glasses on. He has an L-shaped scar on his left cheek and the same circle scar on his right cheek as the honcho suspect has. That is why I thought they could be the same man. So she's not definitively stating he's honcho, but she's saying he could be honcho. Three months later on Easter Sunday, the honcho man came back in with the thick curly hair that was not a wig. No way hair can grow that fast. This is when I realized there were at least two working in tandem. Some in law enforcement believe that there were two working together. Who knows if one is the letter writer, the other the killer. Or the reason for the very different descriptions between Lake Berryessa and the Stein case. Is it because one did the Lake Berryessa crime and the other Stein? More posts here. The costume has not been destroyed. My ex called me a few nights ago, telling me he is getting closer to finding the boxes that were stored at his mother's home in San Leandro. Two of the boxes he found of mine were filled with material. I know that I put the material part of the costume in a box with other material that I saved for sewing projects. I do have other blood evidence from the Lake Berryessa crime scene, but the police only want to test the costume as soon as my ex finds it, and I go there to pick it up. Believe me, the day he calls to say he found the boxes, I will drive to his home and take the costume to the detective who is helping me. No other people being stalked by who they believe is Zodiac has ever received letters that can be proven to be written by Zodiac. I would also like to state that in spite of Final Fury, who said that I was a very mean person and that I have had people banned from sites, I have never done that ever. I did, however, write to his administrator and say that what he was saying about me was slanderous and defamation of character. That sound nasty to him? I guess that letter was told to this low-life shell of a man as his ex-wife said to me about him. So now he finds anything that I post in comments under, under names other than his own, the coward that he is. I actually investigated suspects for other people who have their own suspects. Opposite of what Final Fury has made up, I can say that I have no doubt that the DNA is still on the costume and that the case is about to be solved as soon as it is tested.
Darlene's sister phoned me two days ago saying that our stalker tried to get into her home and she had to call the police. She got a good look at his face and said he is for sure the man I showed her the picture of. The picture was taken August 10th, 1990, 6.30 p.m. He is the man that Vallejo PD said looked like Larry Kane. That was back in 1990. He hasn't changed much at all. There is so much more I could share, but it probably is better that I don't. That is because the more I share, the less I am believed. It shouldn't be too much longer before I have that costume and it gets tested. So just hang on to your hats until that is done. All I can say, I wish I could speed up the process, but it is out of my hands for now. Why can't they speed up the process? There's no volunteers that can help him search a garage. I mean, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. I mean, Lawrence Kane doesn't really look Hispanic. Does he really look Hispanic, though? People were asking more about DNA. Sandy Betts said this. The police do have Zodiac's prints and his DNA. The glass that I gave to SFPD had his right hand print and his DNA. As far as I know, they never tested it because that was before they knew about DNA. The blood spots on the costume would have had to belong to both victims. Brian is AB positive, Cecilia is O negative. So let's try to find some more clarification here on uh, Tapatalk. There's a post here. I don't know if this was posted October 16th, 2021, or just copied from an older post by Sandy Betts. All I know for sure is the one I have a picture of uses the name Anthony, a.k.a. Tony, but so far I don't have his last name for sure. I have a lot of information on RH who I have seen with Anthony and thinking they may be related. I assume the last name could be Hernandez. The three eights in my name cipher, I believe, is for the eighth letter in the alphabet H as a clue to three Hernandez involved or Hernandez the third. The number three is very important to Zodiac. Our Hernandez is still alive and has a large family. I used to wait tables and served them often. Anthony is also connected to the Gentry family who lived near me. I saw Anthony driving their car many times and traced it to them. That same car, a white Jeep, followed my son and his wife all the way to North Lake Tahoe. They waited for my son to go into a casino, then rammed his newly painted car. The two men in the white Jeep left laughing, according to witnesses who gave the plate number to my son to report. It matched the plate I had for Gentry. They are related to Norman Walter Gentry in Vallejo. Norman lived in Napa in 68, was divorced in October 68. He owned a barber shop in Vallejo. I have not seen a picture of him. I looked up Gentry's wife's maiden name thinking perhaps anthony was related her duarte was her maiden name the letter d was used for zodiac's logo as well as the letter z so i feel because of his huge ego it could be a clue to his last name being duarte i have to look at everything and anthony was the man that she got away from in uh, the winter of 68. okay so basically, this is pointing to some kind of ring of individuals. Now, they might have nothing to do with Zodiac. This could just be a twisted ring of individuals because this is what's kind of sad, too. The people just writing off Sandy Betts' story. If she really was stalked by sick people, I mean, you know, that doesn't mean she's lying about things. It's just these people might have just been screwing around trying to make it look like there was a Zodiac. So Sandy stated here, I have seen three suspicious men. Two RHs and Hanjo. If those were last name initials, my guess would be Rodriguez, Phillips, or Poto Hernandez. First name initials, Robert, Paul, or Peter Hanjo. Again, that equals four. I know it sounds highly unlikely because others can't keep something like that to themselves. If true, that would explain the different descriptions of the Zodiac. Someone asked if Hancho noticed when she was taking the photos of him, and what was his reaction? Also, when was the last time you think you saw him? Sandy uh, responded here, Heck yes, he knew I took his picture and walked up close to my back as I was seated at the bar with my back up for protection. I could feel the heat of his body. That is how close he was to me. I thought he was going to try and take the camera. He didn't. He then went to the high top table and my backup took the second picture. By then he removed his glasses. I thought he would kill me that night. 
I went immediately to Wentling's one-hour photo to get them developed in case I was murdered that night. When I got home about an hour and a half later, he had left a message for me on my recorder. He spoke in a robotic voice. Ha ha ha. Meaning he was going to get rid of both myself and my bodyguard. I made copies of the pictures, mailed them to Vallejo, Napa, and SFPD. It has been about two years since I last saw him for sure. I still get odd calls that just say goodbye. So if this was posted in 2021, the last time she saw him would have been 2019-ish, unless this is, again, reposted from an older forum. So a poster here known as Book Collector made some uh, CGI images here to try to get the exact look of Honcho or this guy in the photographs. I have been working with Sandy to create images which will be more accurate than the photos she has posted. The headshot she posted is oversaturated and gives the impression that Hancho had dark reddish skin. These new images are not perfect, but they should be helpful. Notes. Hancho's left side has varied pockmarks. I did not try to capture the exact details. There are two connected scars on the chin. There is a thin scar along the jaw. Smoking. Probably because Hancho's face is partially paralyzed, he holds a cigarette close to his palm. In discussing Hancho's pockmarks, the possibility came up that Hancho could, survive, could have survived a severe case of smallpox or something similar. This could account for his right lazy eye, his partially paralyzed face, and his slightly impaired walking. The trauma from such an illness, especially if family members died, could have been extreme. Response from Sandy, thank you, book collector. This is what he looked like in the late summer. He worked construction outdoors all summer, so he did have a reddish tan when I took his picture. He had a medium complexion in the fall and winter. Notice the way he held his cigarette. It is the very same way the suspect Sandy held his cigarette in June 1963 in Santa Barbara County. And we went over that in episode one, and coincidentally, this is also Sandy. This female Sandy is uh, is making these claims here. I mean, kind of, I mean, I don't know. Coincidence stack is high. The scars match Kathleen John's description. The larger round one on his right cheek ironically has a cross in it. The scar on his right chin has a thin line that joins the top and bottom scars that Kathleen noticed as two. It looks like a Z. I couldn't help but notice all of the scars when I blew the picture up that I took of him. In the high pookie letter he left for me, you can see he drew himself standing next to two victims. He drew himself with his lazy eye. He gave a clue to the girl on the right with her name on a sign, misspelled on purpose, L-Y-N-N, instead of L-I-N. Jenny Lynn, age 14, was murdered in her home in Castro Valley, California, 1994. Her father, John Lynn, was given a warning by the killer just days before John found his daughter's nude body in the upstairs bathroom, not raped. The window next to the downstairs front door was broken from the inside out. I believe to allow her spirit to leave the house and go to paradise. All of Zodiac's victims in cars had a window or door open. The other girl in the drawing was also Asian. I believe was Deanna Hooper, who was last seen at Mare Island in July 1974. Her body was found many months later on St. John's Mine Road, Vallejo. That is 1.7 miles to Blue Rock Springs. My suspect drew himself holding a newspaper, letting me know that both victims had had their stories in the paper. Deanna on the left is holding a heart-shaped kite. Her bones were found by a father and son who were flying kites. One of the kites crashed next to the body. Again, hearts meant something to this killer, I believe, is Zodiac. The heart stamp inside of the Halloween card was the first hint to hearts. Morph's suspect and one of mine were born on Valentine's Day. Notice which letters are underlined on the misspelled name Paul Avery on the envelope. Backward is Val. My husband's name was Val Betts. That could be a clue to Val for Valentine's Day or the name Val. I recently found the name of one possible suspect named Robert Hernandez, born 
February 14th, 1943, in Riverside, California. I will be checking more into that one. The pictures above are of the man I call Hancho, a.k.a. Anthony, who is larger and heavier than his buddy R.H. 1943 is about five years off of Hancho, who looked to be about 30 years old in 1968 and 50 years old in the 1990 photograph. I mean, how many smoking guns are there if that's all legitimate? Now, I'm not saying any of this is legitimate, but it's kind of curious. Like, the coincidence stack is so high, you would think someone would at least investigate few more posts here by Sandy. I do know that before Hancho moved to where I was living in the 1980s, he had lived and worked in Benicia. Everything about Hancho matches what we know about Zodiac. I measured his footprints in the mud in my backyard. The footprints measured 13 inches long by 4 or 5 inches wide. His buddy, RH, has a size that looked to me to be a 9 in a wingtip dress shoe. I raised five children, so I'm pretty good at guessing shoe sizes. Hancho is barrel-chested, talks with a drawl, but not a southern drawl, has a lazy eye, which DOJ said Zodiac had, paralyzed on one side of his face. The same description Darlene's sister Linda said the man D was so afraid of. Here's another post. So someone asked him if... The photo, so supposedly Hancho slash Anthony here, if he was the one who put the costume in the car or if it was someone else, she responded, this is who I was told was Kane. I now call him Hancho. He was using the name Anthony, a.k.a. Tony. I don't know his full name. He is the one I got away from in Vallejo and followed by the winter of 1968. I didn't see who put the costume and other things in my car. I am assuming it was him. This picture was taken in Lyons Restaurant, 6.30 p.m., August 10th, 1990. He had a reddish tan because he was working outside all summer, building the new Antioch police station. The company he worked for was Lathrop Construction in Benicia, about two miles from the Lake Herman crime scene. What's weird, though, is how did they not figure out who this guy was? I mean, she has he was building the Antioch police station, and he worked for Lathrop Construction. How do they not know this guy's name? Some more information here. So this is again, Sandy Betts. My top two suspects. I know it's confusing to keep track, but my suspect told me there were four people involved as Zodiac. To recap, I believe I have seen at least two. One, RH, the one with the shaved head. Two, Honcho, the angry guy at the bar, whom I believe killed Victoria Bell and was the man I saw in 1968. Three, possible, the well-respected community member whose car R.H. was driving. If nothing else, he knows the identities of R.H. and possibly Honcho. It's occurred to me that a reason I haven't been killed is the man knows I gave his plate number to the police, so it's a sort of insurance on my end. Unfortunately, I didn't see who put the newspaper articles on my cocktail tray with the quarter on top of it. Likely Hancho. I believe he was telling me he killed the two women in the news article. Zodiac victim Darlene Farron's sister. Darlene Farron's sister also plays a huge part in my story because the same man I call Hancho was bothering her even before I met her. It was March 1990 when I met her, and that was because an Antioch cop told me that I should get in touch with her. A bit later, doing research, I discovered she lived in Antioch. My eldest daughter, who was scared to death of my stalker and who was also followed by him, went with me to locate her. We knocked on doors, and that is how we found her. We talked for a few hours, sharing information. I had a few license plates memorized, and she said she had some written down in a notebook she kept. That was when we both knew the same man was bothering us. My plate was VLT 885, and hers was VLT 855. Both cars were green. I thought it was a Lincoln or a Cadillac. I forget what she thought it was, but it was clearly the same car. He had to have seen my car at her house because he called when I got home and screamed at me, telling me to stay away from Darlene's sister. She also got a call about the same time telling her to stay away from me. From then on, we had to sneak off to see each other. The police didn't believe her 
and she told me that she and her husband both flunked lie detector tests. They asked me if I would take one. I said absolutely, but they never gave me the test. While I agree that the sister has made up some questionable claims, I do believe her when she says she's been tormented and followed by this man. The similarities are too strong. She said he told her he was the Zodiac. He's never directly told me that. Only sent clues. A few more points here from Sandy. A few cold, case, there, cold cases. There have been many unsolved murders of young women in the same areas where Zodiac hunted. Often nurses waitresses and prostitutes a few examples august 7 1969 nurse helen m farisi who lived in martinez was found in the river between benicia and martinez she was listed as a suicide but something makes me think she could have been murdered a nurse had access to many drugs that can kill without having to jump off a bridge at night March 7th, 1970, Judith Hikari's body was found in Placer County in a shallow grave. She was beaten to death. March 22nd, 1970, Kathleen Johns, who is also a nurse, was taken for a ride near the Modesto area by who she believed was the Zodiac. He later contacted her to let her know he had been watching her and knew that she had another baby girl. He sent her a Halloween card about the same time he sent one to Paul Avery. September 6, 1970. Donna Lass, the third nurse, except her body has never been found. Communications signed by the Zodiac have given clues to her murder and where she is buried. November 11th, 1970. Carol Beth Hilburn's body was found face up in the weeds next to a fence. Her throat was cut and she was beaten so badly she was unrecognizable. Dental charts had to be used to ID her. She was from Santa Rosa but worked at Sacramento General Hospital. In the Antioch, Pittsburgh area, April 22nd, 88, Teresa Colleen Brown, a waitress, drove the same Highway 4 that I did late at night, early mornings. She had gotten off work 2 a.m. Walnut Creek, later was forced off the road off the highway with her car ending up in a ditch down an embankment. She was either pulled from a car or was out of it already when the perpetrator beat and stabbed her to death. She was found the next morning by the CHP. July 18th, 1992, Sharon Matos. Nothing was written about how she was killed. Hard to find information about that case as well. November 12th, 1992, Andrea Ingersoll, who was last seen by my daughter, who dropped Andrea off at a quick stop store. Andrea's murder was listed as traumatic injury. The killer phoned the police to tell them where to find the body and then told the police he was the Zodiac. Of course, the police thought it had to be a hoax and left it at that. My stalker also followed my daughter often and she was terrified of him. November 6, 1998, 15-year-old Lisa Norell kept, her by, kept by her abductor for several days before being killed and dumped at a landscape company yard. She died of asphyxiation. I'm not sure about those exact details on whether she was kept alive or not. December 5, 1998, Jessica Frederick stabbed to death. December 15, 1998, Tammy Davis beaten, tortured, and dumped in a porta potty at a construction site in Pittsburgh. She survived but later died. She was beaten so badly she couldn't talk. The same day, Rachel Cruz was strangled and smothered. January 8th, 1999, Valeria Don China Schultz stabbed and strangled. According to a retired police, Pittsburgh police detective who is now a PI and still very interested in these unsolved murders, he said there were many more victims in the Contra Costa County. He was the one who told me that a man claiming to be the Zodiac confessed to all of the murders. I conducted my own stakeout to see if my suspect was the one killing these girls. I saw him trolling the area where most were picked up. I had been told by my daughter that many of the girls were prostitutes and I could talk to them at 6.30 a.m. on any Saturday morning. So I made several copies of my honcho picture and handed them to the girls standing in line to get their methadone for the weekend. That was when I heard a scream coming from a girl named Louisa who recognized my photo. She ID'd honcho as the man who tried to kill her with a long knife. A few months later, March 30th, 1991, presumably my suspect mails back to me the photo I handed out, which I received on April 1st, 1991, on April Fool's Day. 
April 25th, 2010, Fuang Lei, a 25-year-old nursing school graduate, was found severely decomposed in a remote area of Napa near Lake Berryessa. Authorities announced they have DNA evidence. Cause of death never specified. So if this guy was about 30 to 40 or even 50 in 1990, how old would he be in 2010? I mean, I don't know if that case is related. DNA and items. I know my story sounds far-fetched, but trust me, everything I have said happened exactly as described. I believe Zodiac has continued his killing spree and still alive. I have the following items that can be tested for DNA. Two envelopes, both sent to me before anyone knew about DNA. One letter that had a newspaper clipping taped to it about a woman being stopped. At the top, he typed, thinking of you. I used tweezers to open that letter, so none of my prints or DNA are on it. I believe there is a print on the scotch tape. Wristwatch that I believe could have been Cecilia's, left in the car with costume. The tiny Catholic Bible that I believe was Sherry Jo Bates, left in a car with the costume. And I believe uh, Sandy Betts contacted Sherry Jo Bates' brother and uh, to ask him if this particular Bible was hers. And I don't believe he responded. A surgical rubber glove on which he drew the faces of my five children on each fingertip and wrote destiny with two E's on the palm in blue felt tipped pen. There should be DNA on the part he used to blow up the glove and perhaps the inside of the glove left in my mailbox. The dictionary that was left with the costume had drops of blood on it. A clothesline which was left for me on my doorstep, which I believe is meant as a message regarding the one that disappeared from my Napa home summer of 69. Not sure how good the DNA will be because I touched it many times without gloves. Interesting that on the packaging it shows a woman, a picture of a woman hanging diapers. Diapers were the only thing on my clothesline when it disappeared. The costume is in my ex-husband's garage, the hood I threw out. When people question why I have not claimed it, it is among a hundred boxes in his possession and I don't want to agitate him and have him toss it. He will let me search when he's good and ready. Better to bide my time and secure its well-being than risk its loss. The Bloody Mary glass, I mean, I wonder in this particular case, is a, can a search warrant be procured through the testimony of this woman? The Bloody Mary glass, audio recording, and ruler given to the police were never returned. The glass, I believe, had his handprint on it. I also gave a PI from San Francisco a red heart necklace with the name Cecilia on it. I don't recall where it came from. It was never returned, and all I have is a photocopy. One side shows what appears to be the name Cecilia, and the back has a love poem in Spanish. Antioch police also have a stuffed Christmas bear that I believe has my suspect's DNA on the tape that wrapped five M80s inside the chest of the bear. There was a visible print on the bear. The bear was placed in my yard on July 4th. I can't recall which year. Luckily, only one M80 exploded as dampness prevented the others from blowing and the bear was still intact. I would like to see some police reports on this because these are some, these are some really big claims to say the least. So here's another picture here. This is a picture of a man Sandy spotted in the San Francisco Chronicle in either October 12th or 13th in 1969 when he was arrested for kidnapping a woman down south. Instead of using a sketch, she used this picture as a lifelike model of what RH looks like since she claims both of them look very similar to one another. Note this is not an actual picture of her second suspect. The wristwatch here was left supposedly September 28th or 29th, 1969 in Napa. Sandy believes it's possible this belonged to Cecilia Shepard. The small Catholic Bible was found September 28th or 29th, 1969 inside of the ammo can filled with felt-tipped pens, three earrings, a wristwatch that Sandy believes was Cecilia's. Beside it are items to use for scale. The Bible is, is missing one page, the owner's name. Sandy believed it belonged to Sherry Jo Bates because she was Catholic.
picture of the dictionary that Sandy found in her car one or two days after the LB killing on September 27, 1969. It was found alongside the costume and ammo. There were drops of blood on the cover and inside. Golden letter D earring left for Sandy at her workplace in Oakland, 1988. The suspect told the bartender to give it to Sandy. Red heart necklace left for Sandy with the misspelled name of Cecilia. It had a love poem on the back of it. She is unsure when she got it, but suspects it's possible it was left with the costume and ammo can where she received other items from her suspect. So she's not even claiming to have a perfect memory. This was a card left for Sandy, Napa, 1969. Inside of the card contained the more than just friends correspondence. So regarding this note here, sexual sadist letter was written by Sandy's suspect that she calls Honcho around 1987. He wrote it, gave it to her friend who was a bartender at Lyons Restaurant where Sandy hung out at. He lied and told her that he and Sandy were talking about the Zodiac at the bar a few days before and he wanted to help me catch the Zodiac. Sandy claims she never spoke to any old man about the Zodiac. She thinks one of the purposes of the letter was to get her to buy Graysmith's Zodiac book so she would realize that Zodiac wrote the letters she received. The secretive, mysterious letter was written on a small piece of paper around 1987 by a man who came into Sandy's work at Pier 29 in Oakland. He asked if he could do her horoscope, and she agreed. She remembers where he was sitting at the bar and what he was wearing. He, however, she cannot recall what he looked like. He was dressed well with a nice tan-colored sports jacket. This message was received by Sandy in either, in either 87 or 88 at the Lyons restaurant. She said she was talking with a friend at the bar. She had her back turned, and someone who was behind her must have slipped it in front of her. She says she didn't get a good look at him as he was walking out of the restaurant. The message was written in blue ink on a napkin folded in half. And so, yeah, there, there's a lot of corroboration here for her stories in terms of there seems to have been some kind of stalker, unless she made up, she made all this up and did it herself. There was somebody who was, uh, who was stalking her. And again, doesn't mean it was the Zodiac, but someone obsessed with the Zodiac or pretending to be the Zodiac. I mean, there's a lot of crazy people out there. I mean, there's people who think they're Napoleon in a lot of mental hospitals. It, I mean, is it really that outlandish to believe that there's a bunch of, criminal-minded psychopaths pretending to be the Zodiac. Maybe they even believe they are the Zodiac, even if they're not. They have all these mental conditions, and they stalk people. I mean, I don't find that that difficult to believe. There was also a St. Patrick's Day card representing Darlene Farron's birthday, March 17th, which is also St. Patrick's Day. This was a card she received in the late 80s. This picture was taken in 1990, not long after Sandy met Darlene's sister, Pam Huckabee. The words, Psycho is back, are written behind a Safeway store that Sandy believes was closed at the time. The message RPH plus ME was written on Darlene's sister's, Pam Huckabee's P.O. box, in Pittsburgh, California, roughly around June 1990. Sandy believes it's possible her suspect is saying that he either had three others involved in his killings or perhaps RPH was one person's name, like Robert P. Hernandez, for example. Note that the name mentioned is just a default name and is not the actual name of any suspect, dead or alive. And the Zodiac symbols are here on the P.O. box. Of course, that could just be, again, another random psycho. Hoaxer, whatever. The message, Confusion Prevails, was found by Sandy Betts near the crime scene of a slain jogger. The message was written in a very large green felt-tip pen on a metal guardrail next to the road. The jogger, Maria Whitehofer, age 32, was found strangled to death November 15, 1990, in Oakland. The body was found exactly one year after Sandy was shot at in a tunnel that was close to where the body was found. Sandy also found evidence such as rope and cigarette butts that law enforcement may have missed. This is a drawing of a kill map 
in California featuring over 70 murders made by her suspect before the 12 murdered girls in Pittsburgh, California. She has no idea when or how she got it. She says she found it when going through some of her Zodiac evidence she collected over the years. She believes it's likely she may have gotten it in the early 90s. Okay, weird map here. Envelope that contained the profile picture of Honcho sent to Sandy March 30th, 1991. She gave out the profile picture of her suspect to several hookers with warnings to not get in a vehicle with him. One of the unfortunate young ladies would be murdered where her suspect intercepted the picture and sent it to Sandy where she received it on April Fool's Day as a taunt. So one of them was murdered who she had shown the picture to. That's disturbing. Envelope containing thinking of you letter and stalker message received March 17th, 1994 on Darlene's birthday. Sandy contacted the person in the article and she was told it was from three months before in the San Francisco Examiner. Received on Darlene's birthday, March 17th, 1994, the note simply says thinking of you. Below it is a cutout from the San Francisco Examiner with two pieces of clear tape holding it to the letter that reads, are you a victim of a stalker? If so, you are not alone. If you are interested in our support group, please write Box 134, 3984, Washington Boulevard, Fremont, California, 94538. Confidential. We need each other. Don't suffer alone. The Vallejo Topics is a place Sandy thought she should check out, knowing that if Zodiac was still living there, his ego would cause him to talk about himself without saying he was the Zodiac. Her instinct served her correct when she found a post from December 15th, 2006 that sounded like Zodiac. Sandy made one comment and he never said another word again. Sandy believes he has posted here as 12th house and only wanted to communicate with her. Some users felt he was the Zodiac and told her to be careful. She thought he wanted to help her and didn't pay attention to the warnings. As soon as she gave him the information he wanted, he was gone. So the post here on December 15, 2006, now that Vallejo is back on the map as the quintessential shoot -em up western town, better, I think, than its earlier notoriety as the locus for the Zodiac crime spree, an above-the-law elite college rite of passage that got out of hand because it was so treated by those who should have solved the case by now and were not allowed to do so. Shall we invite some fearless reporter to examine why this is so? Perhaps the drugs. Perhaps, as we all speculate, the closeness of Kaiser and prescription drugs getting out of hand. I mean out of the hands of those who have access to the pill tills. Perhaps the fight between medical marijuana and the mobs has picked Vallejo as its waterloo. If so, please note that's what Marin is for. Move along now. Perhaps after the bravery of Gary Webb was rewarded by a complacent populace, we shan't get so lucky after all. I shall sell tickets to my bedroom window. I shall be posting the pop, 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 pop Friday night sounds on a blog for all to hear and wonder the same. What? That's weird. What a bizarre message. So... Sandy created this handwriting sample sheet in 1998. She included the Ramsey note because she saw that the handwriting was very close to the Zodiacs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is there a connection between the Jean Benet Ramsey case and the Zodiac killer? This is all quite mind shocking. There were also references to the Dirty Harry movie, which was based off of Zodiac. Also, Zodiac apparently mentioned Colorado at Lake Berryessa. John Ramsey had a graphics business office near San Francisco. She believes the killer knew John Ramsey well and punished him by killing his daughter. Furthermore, she states that the white bear that was left by the killer was very much like one that was left for her, except hers was golden brown, but it was a Christmas bear with a hat and a scarf like hers. Remember the three hearts going off in the distance on the pookie letter? A red heart was drawn on Jean Benet's hand. Coincidence, perhaps, and then maybe not. If there's an occult connection, though, and they have all these symbols for the occult connections, is it possible that this cult includes Zodiac and the killer of Jean Benet Ramsey, and they are not one and the same? The E Passion Kite Letter 
was left on Sandy's walkway about 10 years ago, March or April in 2008. It shows him standing between two victims. One was holding a kite, the other with a sign behind her. Sandy found out that an e-passion kite was an Asian or Chinese kite. Both of these girls were Asian. One was Deanna Hooper, killed in Vallejo, 1974. She was found by a man and his son who were flying kites on Columbus Parkway and St. John's Road. One of the kites crashed on top of her bones. The other victim was Jenny Lynn, 1994, in Castro Valley. He misspelled her name using L-Y-N-N instead of L-I-N on the sign. He drew himself with a crew cut and shows his lazy eye that DOJ says Zodiac has. He is pointing at what Sandy believes is a newspaper with both hands. Sandy believes he was saying both of these victims were in the newspaper. They were. A user here noted that one of the lines in the Pookie letter was a line that the Zodiac has used before. I just want you to know. When Sandy found the letter, she thought it looked like a young person wrote it, but kept it just in case it was from her stalker. Also bizarre. Hi, Pookie. I bet you think I'm drawing you a picture, but I'm not. I just wanted you to know that, never mind, we're about to fly this e-passion kite. P.S. You're a liar. Wow, how many stalkers did this woman have? Okay, so here's uh, another post by Sandy Betts. I mean, we're going, we just keep going down farther and farther into mindshot territory here. It's hard to tell such a long story. I still have another 28 years that hasn't been told. I'm so happy to have it on the site so everyone can see what I've been talking about all these years. Perhaps someone will know Hancho's real name. I have been told by more than a few people that his first name is Tony. I am pretty sure the local police know what his name is. I was told by a woman from Napa that her father worked with an ex-Antioch cop. He said that APD believed Zodiac was living in Antioch. One of Hancho's friends said he has moved to Los Angeles a few months ago. That happened about the time when the GSK was caught. I have seen Hancho with RH, so I know they are connected. Hancho is the one I have seen more often. He is the one who followed me in Vallejo in 1968. I am pretty sure he was Don Porter's roommate in Vallejo. He was working construction in the 90s when I took his picture. I can't help but think about the construction going on at the college when Sherry Joe was killed and at Lompoc High when Domingos and Edwards were killed at the beach. Lots of construction at Lake Tahoe when Donna last disappeared. The postcard that Zodiac sent showed construction workers. Could that be the real clue he was sending? Wow. Okay, and just to reiterate, Don Porter is the counterfeiter guy that she mentioned earlier. So a few more posts here. I received letters with upside-down stamps from Don Porter after he was arrested for being in the Vallejo counterfeit ring. The same ring that Darlene's family believed she was in and the reason she was murdered because she wanted out. It was Don Porter who told me that what upside-down stamps meant. Another post about Don Porter by Sandy Betts on the Zodiac Killer Forum Motion.com. The one guy who could have told me was Don Porter, who has passed away. And she's regarding uh, the theory that Darlene was involved in some kind of counterfeit ring, but she was also dating cops and she wanted out of the ring. Mike said that the car looked like her ex's car. So Sandy Betts followed this up with, The one guy who would have told me was Don Porter, who has passed away. I truly believe that his roommate was Zodiac. That was the guy who I heard flip out when Don said the name D in front of me. That guy was about 30 years old in 1968 to 1969, about 5'9", stocky, brown curly hair, liked to play the piano. His voice would odd, was odd as I recall. He didn't yell in a normal voice. It was scratchy and strained sounding as if his vocal cord was damaged. I found some address for Don Porter in Vallejo. One was Evans Street. I need to check the other addresses to see if they will show anyone else living there with him. The true name of the Zodiac could be at one of those addresses. 
Also, people here are discussing that the, the sketch of D.B. The, the D.B. Cooper composite looks like the Zodiac. Wow, what a case. What a case. Here's an audio recording, one of Sandy Betts' recordings from her, I guess, her answering machine. This is creepy stuff here. This is creepy stuff. Listeners, be warned. Is the voice of the man who calls himself my secret admirer, whom Jim D.C. has the voice tape at the San Francisco Police Department. I sent it to him a couple of years ago. The voice on this tape that you'll be hearing is the man who claims to be my secret admirer, who is also the man whose voice I just played for you. Uh, this time he's whispering, so there is some difference. If you care with your name, number, and the time that you call, I'll be happy to get back with you as soon as I can. Thank you. Please wait for the beat. Bye-bye. my phone recorder. So what do we uh, what do we make of that? I mean, that is definitely creepy, creepy stuff. Let's listen to the the, the alleged Zodiac caller on the Jim Dunbar show. Zodiac, a symbol that now stands for terror in San Francisco. Today, there was a possibly significant development in the terrifying case of the man who calls himself Zodiac and has boasted that he is responsible for five murders in the last nine months. In Zodiac's latest letter last week, he threatened to make a busload of school children his next victims. Since then, school buses have been discreetly guarded and parents' fears have openly risen. This morning, the people of San Francisco heard a man who claimed to be Zodiac talking on the air during a television conversation program with attorney Melvin Belli and the program's host, Jim Dunbar. That was the voice of a man who called himself the Zodiac Killer. He's talking to attorney Melvin Belli by phone on a television conversation show. This bizarre situation began at 2 o'clock this morning when the so-called Zodiac telephoned police headquarters. He said he was sick, he needed help, and he wanted to talk to Belli on television. All the scheduled guests were canceled from the show on the ABC station KGO. Belli waited for Zodiac to call on the private line. The phone was not tapped. The killer telephoned 12 times. He spoke very little with attorney Belli trying to draw him out. Jim. Jim said, well, maybe he's afraid of being beaten up or something like that now. Um, what, 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 what can I say? Well, why don't we just ask Sam to tell us a little bit more about what he's feeling right now. What do you, tell us about uh, your, your feelings, Sam. You know, just tell us anything you want to. And then we'll come back and I'll give you a specific answer to this question when you're going to the gas chamber. Uh, stay with us so I can answer that for you. But uh, w w will you uh, attend on Jim just a minute and tell me, tell him what, what you're feeling or, or talk to us. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam, please. I have headache. Right. How long have you had those headaches, uh, Sam? In a long time? Since I killed a kid. If, if it all boils down to the question of you're giving yourself up, if you could be assured that you wouldn't get capital punishment, for myself. I don't want to give myself I, up. Huh? I want to kill those kids. Bill I finally arranged to meet Zodiac in Daly City, a suburb south of San Francisco, to talk in person. The attorney waited in an office building, but Zodiac never showed. I asked Bill I if he thought the man who called really was the Zodiac killer. I can't. Negative. I, I, I can't say. All I can say is this man needed help. This man seemed like a man who was coming up to a storm or to a climax. And, this very blood-curdling thing. Children kill, and then the sort of an agonized cutoff. And 
enough to turn your hair whiter than most. So inside the thrift shop, St. Vincent de Paul, attorney Melvin Belli and the San Francisco police waited for the Zodiac killer. The man did not show, so now all we can do is wait perhaps for that next phone call from the man who calls himself Zodiac, who has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Dick Shoemaker, ABC News, San Francisco. We'll be back with more news in a moment. Now, some believe that this was uh, Eric Wheel, and some don't. I mean, there's a lot of speculation about all of this. So, Eric Wheel was a mental patient, and allegedly he might have been the one who made the call to the Jim Dunbar show, October 1969. Uh, others believe that that was a cover story of some kind. So supposedly there's an unidentified guy in some of these Darlene Farron photographs. I mean, I would think that he's been identified since. But I don't know. Sandy wrote this about the photograph. That picture was taken at her Uncle Frank's house in San Francisco. Darlene looks very unhappy in that picture or stoned. So my guess is she was already married to Jim, who was wearing what looks like a wedding ring. She has on winter clothes and was married to Jim January 1st, 1966. She divorced him a little more than a year later, April 1967, I believe. So that picture could have been taken as late as winter of 67. She went to Reno for what was called back then a quickie divorce. You had to establish residence there in, for, in order to get one of those. That was when she went to work at the Huddle and one other place in Reno. And back then, Reno was known more for crime than it is now or no? Or counterfeiting connections, all these things. Mm, I don't know. Her roommate is someone I have traced to Oregon. She changed her name a few times, so not easy to locate her. She knew about a man who was harassing Darlene in Reno. That is why I want to talk to her. She was from Santa Rosa. Oh, wow, and I forgot on the items. Here's a photo of the... Is this the actual glove? The surgical glove left for Sandy in the spring of 94. It was filled with a liquid of some sort. Sandy believes it's possible it could contain DNA by the responsible. It was tied in a knot at the bottom of the glove. There were five faces drawn in the blue felt tip pen on each finger representing Sandy's five children. The face with the mustache goatee represents Sandy's son who actually had the same exact facial hair. On the palm of the hand, you see some Z-like printing that says destiny. Sandy believes that it was a message from her stalker warning her that if she continues investigating him, killing her children would be their destiny. So let's recap here from Sandy Betts. The reason I call my suspect Honcho is because I believe he is the man Darlene knew who went by that name. He went with Darlene and Jim to the Virgin Islands. I believe he is the person Darlene saw kill someone there. I have shown his picture to almost everyone I meet to try to get Honcho's real name. More than one or two have said his first name is Tony. The picture I have of Honcho I gave a copy to a friend who said he knew someone who has lived in my area for many years and would probably know this suspect. As it turns out, he was right. His cousin did know Tony and told me he was in construction but had moved a few months ago to Los Angeles. I was very sure that Tony did work construction, so I knew he was telling me the truth about knowing him. That was when the GSK was in the news and the announcement that the police were going to try to the same thing to catch Zodiac. I thought, well, now he is close to Mexico where he could hide if he has to. News break. Last Friday... So this was posted August 20th, 2018, unless it was copied from earlier. Last Friday, I am told that Tony was arrested for killing Maria Ramirez in Fresno, California, but was extradited to Mexico for killing a woman there. He is in jail right now in Mexico. Can someone explain to me why Fresno couldn't keep him there? Was it because he killed the woman in Mexico before killing Maria? When he is released from Mexico, when he goes, then he goes to trial in Fresno, question mark? I don't have all the information that I need to investigate this new information. I need to know when Maria was murdered and how, and how do the people who told me this know for sure it was Tony? My informant said Maria was his aunt. That's how he knows. 
This next Friday I should have the answers to my question that the informant didn't have. He is much older man, has bad memory. His cousin asked that I make several copies of Tony's picture that I took so he can hand them out to his friends who may have more information on Tony. This will prove that the man I got away from in Vallejo in 1968 is Tony, and he is a serial killer. I don't know of anyone else that has the kind of proof about their suspect being a serial killer. If I am right, VPD has the DNA of the suspect, and they can't arrest him because he is in jail in Mexico. That could be why we have not heard anything more about the DNA. So I couldn't actually find any information on this. Huh. I couldn't find any more, uh, any more mentions of this murder, but... Actually, here's another post. I was excited when I heard that, spent days looking into Maria's murder. The two who told me about Maria's murder didn't give me much to go on, so I called, called both the police and the sheriff's department to see if they could find when Maria was murdered. They went back as far as 13 years and didn't find anything. Then I spoke to another informant, and he said, oh no, it was not Tony who killed his aunt. No one ever found who killed her, and it was more like 20 years ago. Now I am told that Tony has passed away. Tony's girlfriend told my informant he died of alcohol disease. This informant has spent time in federal prison. How much can I count on as being the truth? For all I know, the informant told Tony that someone named Sandy was asking questions about him. Tony could have told him to say that he died. I am pretty sure I saw Tony about three months ago. So I went to the library, looked as far back as two years for a Tony or Anthony who died in C.C. County. I found two, but they were either too old or too young. On December 12, 2018, I received some calls in the afternoon like I used to get from my suspect. So as far as I'm concerned, he is still alive. I am not letting my guard down just yet. I forgot to mention the informant told me Tony had lived in Benicia before moving to my town, that he had worked out of Benicia and was a plasterer. The girlfriend told him he beat her all the time. If he is Zodiac, it wouldn't surprise me that he likes to beat up women. This is common of cowardly men. And if that's true, if maybe he's responsible for some of those prostitutes that were beaten. Sandy apparently here has provided photographs of her stalker in some various vehicles late 80s early 90s in front of a donut shop here sandy said about these photos he followed me to the donut shop that morning parked almost behind me my car is the silver rx7 shown in front i went into the donut shop took this picture as i saw him adjusting his rear view mirror to see what i was doing he sat there for about 45 minutes Huh. Wow, so, I mean, on these forums, apparently she did take photos. It looks like she documented a lot of the stalking. Although, again, some could say she's just taking random photos, but, I mean, at least she's got something. These aren't just words on a forum. These are photographs that she took. And for those that uh, are saying that Sandy never lived in Napa, she provided uh, a photo of one of her, her old driver's licenses. Wow, from, what is this, 1973? Whoa, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Regarding the photos of the truck here, this was someone who was parked on the corner where I lived. He would sit there for a few hours each day for many days. It got the attention of my neighbors who knew I was being stalked. One male neighbor went up to the man in the truck and asked what he was doing there. That, there is a lady who is being stalked by someone around the corner, so he was curious why he was there for so long. The man said he was new to the area and just checking it out, and that he too was being stalked by some woman. That's, okay, wait a second. <laughs> this is kind of weird. So a guy's hanging out on a corner for hours at a time, days on end, and, it, and somebody goes up to question him and say, you know, there's a lady being stalked around the corner. The guy says, oh, I'm new in the area. By the way, I'm also being stalked by a woman. I also have a stalker who's a woman, as if to say that this woman was stalked. I mean, what does everybody make of this? I mean, this is also mind shocking. And then here's another photo of what looks to be the same exact corner here. 
The white car was very much like the car the Zodiac had in 69. It would also park there on the same corner. I never saw who drove it. I took the picture just in case it was another car that the stalker had access to. And that's another thing, too. Apparently, if she's being stalked by one, two, or three people, they still have, they seemingly have way more than vehicles than two or three to be stalking her with. The plot thickens even further because of the Santa Rosa murders and the missing single earrings. These murders were between 72 and 73 Santa Rosa hitchhiker murders. A series of at least seven unsolved homicides involving female hitchhikers in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa of the North Bay Area of California. Sandy wrote this. I felt the same way about the single earrings, even though law enforcement and my good investigative buddy Siegel, who knows those cases very well, disagree that Zodiac did some of those murders. I can connect my RH suspect to victim Eva Blau. She was taken from Oakland and her father owned the company where RH worked. That to me is compelling. Also that clothesline what was used at Lake Berryessa was used on one victim from what I have read. Law enforcement can't see past the M.O. for these crimes, even though Zodiac said he would change his way of collecting slaves for his afterlife. The timing fits for Zodiac to continue on after Paul Stein. Here's yet another mind-shocking post from Sandy. I mean, Sandy really needs to have her own documentary where, like, a full team of investigators tries to corroborate all of this information. So his buddy who looked like Kane uses the first name of Tony, a.k.a. Anthony. Being Anthony was with R. Hernandez following me, I felt that he might also be a relative with the last name of Hernandez. There was an Anthony Hernandez who lived with his in-laws in Napa in the late 60s. They lived across the street from the phone booth where Zodiac placed his call not even 50 yards from their home. I mean, what does everybody make of that if that's true? Here's some more crazy posts. And by crazy, I'm not saying they're not true, but it's just mind-shocking. I think, Zo by Sandy Bats, I think Zodiac liked all kinds of music, jazz, rock and roll, etc. I have no doubt he saw Dirty Harry and could have been watching it being filmed in San Francisco. I was there watching the filming, partly because I was dating the lighting director and, of course, a fan of Clint Eastwood. I am sure Zodiac saw most of Hitchcock's movies. My suspect was seen by one of my female friends during the 90s. He was dressed in a nice powder blue suit and told her he was going to Oakland to see the Rolling Stones concert. He looked to be in his early 50s at the time. The Rolling Stones were in Oakland on January 25th, 1999. Hancho would have been closer to 60 by then. Huh. So apparently Jim Crabtree, Darlene's ex-husband, possibly knew this Hancho guy. Possibly some criminal rings involved. One more thing regarding Mike McGow from Sandy Betts here. I found Mike in L.A. just in time for the Now It Can Be Told TV show. He went by his middle name at that time. He was listed in the phone book. I was in L.A. and on a gut feeling I decided to look and see if he was listed and he was. I gave that information to Darlene's sister Pam and she gave it to Geraldo Rivera. I will never forget what he said when she told him that she knew he knows who killed her sister. He did not know at the time he was being filmed. He told her there were too many names for him to remember. This goes along with my theory that Darlene got into a group of bad people that were making counterfeit money in Vallejo during the 60s. I did not know at the time that I was dating one of those people. It was his roommate that I believe is the Zodiac. <laughs> 